everybody thanks for watching now this whole hebrew israelite doctrine is something that we have been watching grow for years now it's not too many cities in america that you can go into today and not find hebrew somewhere on the corner you know teaching their doctrine so a lot of people today are really following this doctrine a lot of people are really starting to believe the hebrews now I get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel, mostly from Hebrew Israelites, and you know they don't watch the video. They'll just leave like a, a hateful comment or just like plug a link in there to one of their videos or something like that. But I also get a lot of questions about the whole Hebrew Israelite doctrine. You know, a lot of people want to know like why does Deuteronomy 28 make so much sense for Black people? And you know, the whole thing about Deuteronomy when you start going through it, especially Deuteronomy 28 when you start reading about it, you know. About the first half of it is about, you know, what will happen if we obey God. And then the rest of it is mostly, you know, what will happen if we disobey God. But when you read, you know, Deuteronomy 28, it basically explains for black people why we are in the state we are in today, why we are in such a deficit, why we are, why we were enslaved, why we are where we at today as a people. So, of course, for black people, it's like, you know, this must be the truth. You know, this has to be right. It makes so much sense. Everything fits. Now, one of the problems with the whole Hebrew Israelite doctrine is just like Christianity, just like Islam, you got a bunch of people within the religion who believe in different things. So you'll find some Hebrews who do not believe in the New Testament. They don't follow it. They believe it's fraudulent. And you got some Hebrews who just don't want nothing to do with Africa. They hate Africa. You know, you got some Hebrews who do follow the New Testament, some who do, you know, or who are okay with Africa. So, you know, it makes it hard for a person to really critique the religion or really get into it and research it because you don't know who believes in what and, you know, how to really attack certain Hebrews because what will happen is you'll find a Hebrew who will say, well, I don't believe in the New Testament or, well, I don't believe in this. Well, I don't think he came from this tribe. I don't think he came from that tribe. So the thing is, I have to address, you know, what I've been hearing. So let me say this first before I go any further. If I say something that does not fit with your Hebrew Israelite doctrine, that does not fit with what you believe as a Hebrew, understand that it does fit with somebody's doctrine. It fits with one of these Hebrews because they have addressed it to me or I have spoken to them about this specific thing. So if I say something about the New Testament, don't say, well, we don't believe in the New Testament. Well, some Hebrews do. So let me get that out of the way first. So according to the Hebrew Israelites, this thing really begins with the end of the flood, the whole Noah's Ark story. We all know Noah and his family was spared because they had the only bloodline that wasn't tainted by evil or corrupted by evil. So they were spared. Now, after the flood, they was, of course, left with the task of repopulating the planet. Now, Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, according to the Hebrews, Ham would basically be the father of the African race. They would be where the Egyptians and the Africans come from. They come from the line of Ham. Now, Japheth is supposed to be where, depending on which Hebrew you speak to, where the white race or where the Asians come from, Japheth. And Shem would basically be where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and according to the Hebrew Israelites, African Americans come from the line of Shem. Now, Depending on which Hebrew you speak to, this varies. And they always go back and forth about who came from what tribe and what. But I want to address like basically what I've been hearing or what I've been researching so far. Also, the Hebrews are also saying that the Israelites are black. They are the true Jews. So these white Jews who we've grown up to know as Jews and the Jews who we see in the Holocaust, according to the Hebrew Israelite doctrine, these Jews are not the real Jew Jews. They are imposters. And really, the African-Americans, the people who are enslaved in America, are the true Jews and are the Hebrew Israelites, a part of the 12 tribes, along with uh, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, uh, Mexicans, and Native Americans, and what have you, depending on what Hebrew you speak to. But these are the real 12 tribes of Israel, the real Israelites, the real Hebrews, not the these guys, the people who we have grown up to know as Jews. So that's one of the main things that they stress in the doctrine. Also, they also believe that black people, African-Americans in America did not come from Africa. They came from Israel. 
Now that's one of the main parts of the doctrine that I really disagree with and we're going to get into all that. Now, let me make it clear that I do not disagree with anybody being black. I don't disagree with Noah being black. I don't disagree with Moses being black. As a matter of fact, if you read the Bible, if you read Exodus, it tells you that Moses was able to blend in with the Egyptians. And we know the ancient Egyptians was black. So, of course, Moses had to be black. I don't disagree with Jesus being black. I don't disagree with the Israelites being black. The whole thing is, if they were black or if they were white, this raises a lot more questions that I think the Hebrews and a lot of other people don't see. It raises questions that I think people don't know to ask. And I'm going to point out these questions later on. But also, it doesn't matter if they was black because it does not prove anything. Even if they were black or what have you, it doesn't prove the Bible correct. It doesn't prove the doctrine is correct. It doesn't prove anything. So to me, you know, if you want to say they're black or whatever, okay, they was black. And obviously, if the Bible is real, if Jesus was real, of course, they was black. So let me make it clear. I don't have it. I don't have a problem with anybody being black. So according to the Hebrew Israelite doctrine, the reason why black people was enslaved in America is because they disobeyed God. They broke God's covenant. Now, remember, they are saying that the slaves that were enslaved in America are not from Africa, but they are, in fact, from Israel. They are from the 12 tribes of Israel. And the whole reason why they were in America being enslaved is because of God's covenant and they broke God's covenant and they disobeyed God. Now they go to Deuteronomy 28 and point to Deuteronomy because it says what would happen to the Israelites if they disobeyed God. So when you go to Deuteronomy 28, 68, it says, and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. Now, according to the Hebrews, Egypt is not actual Egypt. They are saying that Egypt, what they're referring to here when they, when they speak of Egypt is slavery, not Egypt itself, but slavery. Now it says, and the Lord will bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way thereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So they point to this verse as saying, see, the Bible warned us that if we disobey God, this is what happened to us, and we disobey God, and we went to America, and they point to America as being Egypt or being a place of slavery because, of course, slavery took place in America. But, of course, some people are going to say, well, America is not Egypt. Now, if you look at the back of a $1 bill, you will, of course, see the pyramid on the back of a dollar. We know that that's a part of a crest. That's a part of a crest, the American crest. You know, the other side is the eagle, and the other side is the Egyptian pyramid. But, of course, if you go to Kemet, Everybody knows that they got those symbols from Kemet, from Egypt. And here's the originals and here's what they stole. So we can clearly see that. So the Hebrews are saying that the Bible was trying to tell us that, you know, slavery took place in Egypt where the Hebrews was enslaved. And of course, according to the Hebrew Israelite doctrine, they were also enslaved in America. So the Bible, that verse through the Rhyme 2868 was telling us that they would go to Egypt or into bondage or in slavery and America is representing Egypt with that whole Egyptian pyramid. So we're going to get into later on that whole pyramid thing and the crest on the dollar bill. I'm going to get into that later on and explain that later. But of course, when you start reading Deuteronomy 28, you can see what they mean by the whole slavery thing and what took place because it, it really describes it really describes slavery, what was going on in America. So, you know, let's go to Deuteronomy 28, 45. Now, when you go to Deuteronomy and you start reading 45, it says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of, thy, of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes with he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thy enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck 
until he have destroyed thee. Now, when you read this as a black person, when you go back and you just look at the pictures from slavery, you can see that they are describing things that actually happened during slavery. I mean, you can see the pictures of the iron around the slave's neck. So it's like when you read in Deuteronomy, it's almost like it's really predicting the future and what happened. You know, I can understand as a person who is not uh, learned or who doesn't do any research or who doesn't know what's really going on, how anybody can listen to the Hebrew Israelite doctrine and and kind of fall for it and, and, and kind of believe it because, I mean, it's really describing what's going on. But the whole thing is this. If you do not do any research, if you don't understand history, if you don't understand what we can actually prove, then you won't you will fall victim to this. You will you will fall for this whole doctrine. And the reason why I am not one of you Hebrews or falling for this doctrine is because I know what's going on. I can understand why the Bible is saying that and what that means. So I'm not going to go in there and say, oh, well, the Bible didn't mean that and give you a different interpretation of what Deuteronomy is saying. Because to me, Deuteronomy is clearly talking about slaves, clearly talking about black slaves. There's no way around that. I'm going to admit that 100 percent. Now, the thing is, later on, I'm going to show you why it's saying that. And it's going to make more sense than what these Hebrews is telling you. And I'm going to give you proof and I'm going to back it up with proof and common sense and sources. They're not going to give you any of that. So you have to understand something about the Hebrew Israelite doctrine. Let me say this, because in order for their doctrine to work, they have to change a lot of things. In order for their doctrine to fit and to, to be what they want it to be, they have to change and modify history. And the problem with that is history is still history. It's proven history. So when you do the research and you go back and look at certain things, you can see clearly what's up and what's going on. I'm going to point these things out in this video so hopefully people will wake up and understand what's going on. Now, another thing I want to explain is the two kinds of Hebrews. I want to just go into two different types of Hebrews that I've been encountering, you know, over the years who's, you know, speaking about this doctrine. Now, you got the one Hebrews who believe in the New Testament. They completely believe in Jesus and worship Jesus and love Jesus. Those are the dumb Hebrews to me. Now, no disrespect, but then you got the Hebrews who don't believe in the New Testament. They said the New Testament is completely fraudulent. It's bull crap, and they don't believe in it, and they don't follow it. They don't, they don't believe in Jesus, and they believe that whole thing is some kind of Roman trick and, you know, a setup. And now, one of the reasons why those Hebrews don't believe in the New Testament is because, you know, the New Testament kind of takes away from the whole, how the, the specialness of the Hebrew Israelites. It takes away from them being set apart. Because <clears throat> in the New Testament, Jesus comes along and say, it don't matter if you're Greek or Jew, Gentile, whatever. Everybody can be saved. We are all the same. We are all equal. Forget that whole set apart Hebrew Israelite stuff. Everybody is the same as long as you have faith and believe in the Holy Spirit and Jesus and all this and that. You can go to heaven. So they don't like that. You know, they don't like the whole anybody can be saved and all this and that and everybody's they don't like that they like the old testament where they say we are special we are set apart we are your Shah's people we are god's people we are different from everybody else and the white people are going to die and die and, and and the ones who usually lean towards not believing in the new testament are the real racist ones well i shouldn't say racist or the ones who really hate white people those are the ones who lean more towards not believing in the new testament now, the reason why I call the Hebrews who believe in the New Testament stupid is because when you accept Jesus, the whole Jesus argument, it kind of like, you know, what's the point of the whole Hebrew Israelite argument? You know, what's the point of pointing all this stuff out when Jesus comes along in the New Testament and says that all you got to do is believe in me. All you got to do is have faith, believe in the Holy Spirit, and we can all go to heaven. We are all equal. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that, you know, the Hebrews who believe in the New Testament want to come out and point out the fact that these white Jews are not the true Jews, that they are frauds. But the Bible also tells you that they will be frauds. I mean, Revelation describes that, you know, they will be rich and they'll have money. And those Jews do not fit the whole description of Deuteronomy. So, I mean, it's, it's almost clear 
And, you know, you can't really fault yourself for people not reading the Bible and understanding what it says. But, you know, when you accept Jesus Christ in that doctrine, you also accept all of the problems that Jesus Christ comes with. The whole parallel with the Son, the whole parallel with Zoroastrianism and all the other things that the New Testament, you know, has issues with. So you accept all that baggage when you accept the New Testament. Now, for those Hebrews who only subscribe to the Old Testament, this is the problem. Most of these Hebrews still read the King James Version. They still swear by the King James Version and saying the same things like, you know, King James was a Hebrew and he was black and this and that. They still stick with the King James Version. Now, the problem with that is this. The King James Version contains the Old and New Testament. So when you think critically, when you use critical thinking, if the New Testament is fraudulent, then the whole King James Bible has to be fraudulent. Because if they went through the trouble of creating the fraudulent New Testament, meaning they created it because they did not want to give you any truth. They wanted to deceive you. Why would they then give you the truth in the Old Testament? So basically, if the New Testament was created to deceive you, why would they create it to deceive you, then put it in a book along with the truth that they're trying to deceive you from? So if the Old Testament is the truth and you believe in it because it's the truth, then why would they give it to you if they were trying to deceive you with the New Testament, if you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so here's the thing. For the Hebrews who actually accept the New Testament and the Old Testament, as I said before, Jesus comes along in the New Testament and he says we are all equal. We are all one. So, yeah, I understand they want to prove that point that these Jews who everybody think are Jews, these white Jews, are imposters. It doesn't really matter when the New Testament and Jesus comes along and says, I don't care if you're Greek or Jew, as long as you believe in me and believe in my word and believe in the Holy Spirit and all that. You can go to heaven. You can be saved. We can all be forgiven of our sins. It doesn't matter what color, race or creed you are. As long as you accept Christ, as long as you accept his words, you can be saved. So it doesn't really matter. You might as well be a Christian as far as I'm concerned. But. For the Hebrews who only accept the Old Testament, now there's a problem as well because, you know, the Old Testament is really old and we don't have the actual original copies. Same thing with the New Testament. We don't have the originals. We have copies of copies. So it makes it hard for us to go to the Old Testament and say this is correct. It is the right thing. And that's one of the problems with religion. No matter what you want to say, no matter how much we go back and forth and disagree with each other, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, when the debate is done, you still have to have faith. I don't. I have my points. I can put my points out there and say this is my proof against it. But when you present your case at the end of the day, you still have to have faith because there's no proof, which is why the religion requires faith. Now, for the Hebrews who I do speak to in the comment section, it's usually the same argument. They'll say something like, I don't understand what the Bible was saying because I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit. Or I can't understand what the Bible was saying. I can't interpret it the correct way because I'm not a Hebrew. There's always something to that effect on my interpretation of the Bible or when I give them a Bible verse that goes against something that they, they're, they're saying. So it's always some kind of excuse like that. It's always about the Bible. You know, Hebrews always go into the Bible and use the Bible to try to prove their point. And my whole thing is this. The Bible itself is in question. So you cannot use the Bible as proof as if it is a proven source. The Bible is not proven. So you can't go into the Bible to prove the Bible is correct when the Bible itself is in question. Now. The reason why they go into the Bible, because it's in question and it's not proven and it's left up to interpretation, which is why in this video, I'm going to use history and history is what's going to really show you the truth about this whole Hebrew Israelite doctrine. And this is stuff that we can prove and stuff that we know is true and stuff that has been written down by numerous people and has been substantiated. So understand when I use a Bible verse, when I quote the Bible verse, when I quote Bible verses in this video or in any of my videos, I do so because they use the Bible and I have to show what they are using to prove my point. 
Like I was saying before, you can't be a Hebrew and believe in the New Testament, walking around saying that we are all set apart and the Jews are special when you believe in the New Testament. And Jesus comes along in the New Testament and says we are all the same. We are all equal. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter. So this is why I use Bible verses to help prove my point. But now, let me get into this information. Let me get into it because I don't want to take up too much time. But as I was saying earlier, I can understand why a lot of people really go for the Hebrew Israelite doctrine when it comes to uh, the whole Deuteronomy part. Now, it's going to really be geared more towards black people in our whole, you know, relation with slavery. Every every black person who reads that Deuteronomy is going to feel that verse. Deuteronomy 28, 45 through 49, where you're just reading it. And, you know, in other verses as well. I mean, you can understand that. I mean, you can understand where it's coming from. And it's like, man, that has to be the truth. As I said before, I'm not going to refute who it's talking about. It is clearly 100% talking about African slaves. There's no way around that. But here's the thing. This is the problem. The reason why people are reading Deuteronomy and thinking it's the real thing and thinking that, you know, the whole Hebrew Israelite doctrine has to be true. It's because they are thinking that Deuteronomy is the same as the original Bible when it's not. So people are reading the Bible, they read in Deuteronomy 28, and they are thinking that it says the exact same thing that Moses wrote when he wrote the Torah, when he wrote the five books. So they think it's the exact same thing as the ancient manuscripts. They think it's saying the exact same thing. So of course, when you read Deuteronomy 28, and you read from 45 to 49, and you read all of the parts that's talking about slavery, you would read that and you would think, wow, they wrote that way back in ancient times. They wrote that way before slavery happened. So they knew it's prophecy. They knew what was going to happen to us. And it's describing exactly what happened to the African-Americans in America for our slavery. So it's some kind of prophecy. But as I said, the problem is this is not so. And if you don't do any research, you're not going to understand what took place and what happened. And I'm going to go through the history of this because I have to do it in order for you to understand what happened. Now, remember, we do not have the original five books of Moses. We don't have the originals. We don't have the original New Testament. We don't have the original Old Testament. We don't have any originals. We have copies of copies, and all of these copies are different from each other. All of the codexes, all of the codices are different from each other. So understand, like, these Hebrews are using the King James Version. Most of them subscribe to the King James Version. The problem is you want the Old Testament and its original Hebrew. And that's been a problem over the centuries, trying to get the Old Testament to fit what it originally said. And so many people, so many scholars and kings and rulers have put time and money into trying to get the translation correct for whatever reason. I'm going to go into that later. But as it stands today, the oldest copy the oldest complete copy of the old testament in hebrew is the leningrad codex the leningrad codex is the oldest complete old testament in hebrew now of course the dead sea scrolls is older than the leningrad codex is much older than the leningrad codex but the dead sea scrolls is not complete the dead sea scrolls is in a lot of pieces now the aleppo codex used to be the oldest complete Old Testament in Hebrew, and as a matter of fact, the Aleppo Codex is actually a better quality codex than the Leningrad Codex, but in 1947, it disappeared because the UN established a Jewish state in Palestine, and there was a rebellion that went on there, there was a riots that went on there, and it disappeared, and it didn't turn up until like 1957, 1958, and it was missing a lot of pages. Then the Leningrad Codex became the oldest complete Old Testament written in Hebrew, now, as I said before, a lot of Hebrews do not reference those codices. They stick to the King James Version. And when I point these things out later on and show you how the King James Version is different, you can see where Deuteronomy is going to be different. But it's a lot of history that goes with it for you to understand where I'm coming from. So I'm going to get into that. Now, as I said, I don't have a problem with the Hebrew Israelites being black. I don't have a problem with Jesus being black and all that. But... I have a problem with King James being a black man. Now, I understand for the Hebrew Israelite doctrine that he has to be black because then you would say, well, a white man gave us the King James Version. But to 
refute all that, they say, well, King James was a black man. They have to, I mean, they, they doctrine depends on King James being a black man because then every black person can say, well, that doctrine came from a white man. King James was a white king. Look at his mom. Look at his dad. It was white. It was Scots. He was white, but that he has to be black in order for the king, for the uh, whole Hebrew Israelite doctrine to work. But then you have to ask yourself a few questions. Why would they accept the doctrine of a black man when they are enslaving black people? If, according to the Hebrews, if he was a Hebrew, if he was an Israelite, King James, why would they accept his doctrine? Why would they accept the doctrine of this black man, these white people? Then later on, why would they hide the fact that he was black? Now, when you look up King James, they obviously do not tell us that he was a black man. When you see the pictures, he's a white man. When you see pictures of his family, they are white. His parents are white. They are obviously hiding the fact that he was black, if he was black. But why would they go through the trouble of hiding the fact that he was a black man, but then turn around and give us his doctrine and say, it's the truth. If they hide in the fact that he was black, then they're trying to deceive us. So why would we expect them to give us any truth in his Bible? Why would we expect that? So if the Bible was saying, and the whole Hebrew Israelite doctrine is saying that we would be enslaved to our enemies. So that's this white man, our enemy. Why would we expect our enemy to give us the truth? Now, regardless of what you want to say, that King James is a black man and he wrote the Bible, who distributed the Bible? Who passed that Bible throughout America? Who got that Bible around? It wasn't us. It wasn't black people. It was the white man. A black man did not invent the printing press. Black people did not own these printing shops and these companies around America. That was owned by white men. They could have changed the text at any time. King, J king James died, you know, soon after the King James words that came out. I think it was uh, uh, 1620 or 1620-something. But why would we expect them to give us any truth? Now, the Hebrews walk around all day saying, the white man is the devil. The white man is the devil. Well, why would we expect the devil to give us any truth? Why would we expect them to care about our soul so much and to care about us understanding who we are to give us the truth in the King James doctrine, but then not tell us that King James was a, a black man? Now, this raises even more questions when it comes to the Bible itself and this whole issue of color. But this is what I was talking about earlier early in the video. It raises too many questions for Jesus to be black or white, Moses to be black or white, and them not definitively tell us. Now, there are a few instances in the Bible when it describes something as being black or white. Now, we know that the Romans were white. We know the Greeks was white. And according to the Hebrews, the Israelites were black. So if these are supposed to be eyewitness accounts, we know it's supposed to be eyewitness accounts of Jesus' crucifixion. So they could see that Jesus was a black man and the Jews were black, but the Roman soldiers had to be white, that the Greeks were white. So why is it not a definitive description of black and white in the Bible? Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, color don't matter. Maybe they didn't want to make a point of color. Well, if the Hebrew Israelite doctrine is saying that the white man is the devil, then we need to know who the white man is. Who was white? Who was black? We need, we need a description of who is who. But you have to understand that the Bible was created to deceive people. It was created to justify slavery, to justify war. So you cannot put Jesus as black. You can't put Jesus as white. And let me explain why. The reason why you can't definitively put Jesus as a white man, because most people will say, well, why didn't they just say Jesus was white in the Bible? If they wrote the Bible, if they wanted to control us with the Bible, if they wanted us to worship a white guy, why would they not just say definitively in the Bible that Jesus was white? Now, we grew up with all these images of a white Jesus, white Jesus everywhere we went. They pounded a white Jesus in our head. You look at Passion of the Christ. Jesus was a white man. He looked at white to me. So they've been pounding a white Jesus in our head. So why not definitively put in the Bible that Jesus was a white man? Now, the reason why they cannot do that is because science is going to prove it wrong. Science is going to come along and say, well, there's no way in the world 
he could have been white in this part of the world. There's no way in the world his line could be white because we know from a scientific fact that black people was here long before white people. And then that would completely destroy the Bible, would completely cripple it if you say definitively that Jesus was white. Now, the reason why you can't say definitively that Jesus was black either is because if you have a plan in place to enslave the masses of black people in Africa, if you have a plan in place to steal our history, to steal our knowledge, to keep us in poverty and out of power for hundreds of years, you can't turn around and have white people worship a black guy and expect them to follow your plan. Because if they bowing down and praying to a black guy in their time of need, they're going to feel guilty about what they're doing to black people and they're not going to want to go through with it. They're not going to sit by and let the things happen to us that have been happen happening to us over these years and then pray to a black guy. They would not be able to do it. So you can't say definitively that Jesus was black either. You have to leave it up to interpretation. Now, when you look at it, they have already basically told the world that he was white without having to put having to put it into the doctrine with the power of motion pictures. So when we look at these movies and we see Jesus being played by a white person, Noah is white, Moses is white, the ancient Egyptians being played by white people. We can't go to them and say, well, science says that there's no way that Noah could be white because science tells us that black people came before white people. Then they can say, well, it's just a movie. It's just a movie. It's just the person who we got to play a role. But they still get to put into the minds of the masses of people that God is white. Noah is white. Moses is white and get around the whole problem of the Bible not definitively mentioning Jesus being black or white, and they get to take advantage and cast themselves as being the image of God. The Bible is supposed to be eyewitness accounts. We're talking about prophecies, predictions from the future. Revelations is a prophecy about the future. It gives a description of Jesus Christ, but it does not definitively tell us if he's black or or white. It leaves it up to interpretation. Hair white like wool, feet like brass in a burning furnace. This is not a description. This is bull crap. This is playing games. Now, if you have a prophecy about our future, then you understand that in our future, in our time, we describe people as being black or white. So to not definitively say that Jesus was a black man, Jesus was a white man, shows deception. And you can't say that, well, maybe they, they didn't want to put a definitive description because they didn't want it to be about color or race. But we know in our future, we know now today that the white race have definitively taken the image of Jesus Christ and cast them as a white person. And you have more people believing Jesus is white than black. How is that truth? If the Bible wanted to give us truth, it would have told us definitively that Jesus was black definitively to take away from somebody taking the power of putting the image of Jesus Christ in their race of their color. So now this is going to be it. I'm going to go in here and go through this history and go through this information and everything that I have shown you that the Hebrews believe in and all the stuff they're talking about. I'm going to go ahead and destroy all that and rip it all to pieces and show you the truth and show you what has taken place and show you what history is saying and show you what we can prove. The Bible is not proof. It is not a proven fact. They always run to that Bible because the people who wrote that Bible were smart. And they understood that later on, people will be able to prove this stuff wrong. That's why they got all the little warnings in there saying people like me and others will come and tell you all the truth. And we would be liars and sinners and working for Satan and all this and that. Because they knew that history would not back up this Bible. They understood that. But they want you to go into that Bible and say, you know what, this is real. This is true history. When we can go back and look at history and we can find facts, actual proof that does not support the claims of the Bible. So the Bible wants you to forget your own eyes and what it's seeing. I want you to forget common sense. Only Allah will require you to have blind faith. 
Only a lie will require you to forget your common sense and forget what you are seeing with your own eyes and accept one side of the story. Only a lie. So now we are about to get deep into it. We're going to go through this thing and examine it like a forensic analysis. We are really going to go into details. We're going to go through history and we're going to put the pieces together like we Matlock, like we in a court of law. And we're going to go by what we can prove, not by some fairy tale book. We're going to go by what's proof, what we can prove and what we know and what history is telling us. This is what we're going to go by. But first, I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to say something that some people are just going to say flat out. It's crazy. And some people are not going to believe. But I got into this in my last video. That's getting the Bible and Christianity finally explained. So in this video, I'm going to go a lot deeper into it and get into a lot more details and history about it. And of course, I'm going to give you a lot of sources and I'm going to back it up with proof and I'm going to back it up with common sense. And we're going to get into this thing. So first, let me say this. I'm going to just break it down to you and just give it to you straight out flat before I prove my point. The Greeks made up the Old Testament. Plain and simple. This is what history is telling us. The Greeks came up with your Old Testament. They made the whole thing up. They copied it and stole it and basically used Greek mythology and uh, plagiarized it and made it into different stories and added a lot of philosophy into it and a lot of mathematics into it and basically gave the Old Testament to what we are supposed to believe is the Hebrews, but we're not Hebrews. They were the Egyptians that was in Israel. And we're going to go through all that. So what I'm saying basically before I get into the information is the Greeks came up with your Old Testament. I went into this a little bit in the last video. I'm going to go into it a lot more. It was the Greeks. They came up with the Old Testament to control the Egyptians that was in Israel. It was no Hebrews. And I know people are going to say, well, that's crazy. And not after I go through this information, I'm going to show you what has taken place. And we're going to shed a lot of light on this whole deception. So, listen, let me be a lot more clear on what I just said. Because I know a lot of people are like, what the hell? I know a lot of people will stay away from this subject. A lot of people wouldn't touch it. You're not going to find what I'm about to show you in one single book. You have to read a lot of books to put this stuff together. And I think that's by design. But a lot of people wouldn't touch this topic, but I want to make it a lot more clear. There was no such thing as a Hebrew or Jew during the time of Ramses, period. But I'm going to go one further. There was no such thing as a Hebrew or Jew before the Greeks invaded Egypt. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, man, that's crazy. They found artifacts and we have this. We're going to explain all that. I'm going to explain that whole thing. You got to remember to take your mind out of this Bible because it's not proven. If you're looking at the Bible as history, then you're not looking at real history. You can't take the Bible as history, then compare it to history outside the Bible, and then say it's equal when it's not. All of the pieces are there. They're not hiding this information. It's right in front of you. There was no such thing as a Hebrew during that time. And I'm going to get into the proof and I'm going to show you that the Greeks came up with this whole mess. And the people who we think are Hebrews are actually Egyptian. Now, what's suspect is Herodotus never mentions the Hebrews. He doesn't talk about them. And all of the writings of Herodotus, he never mentions the Hebrews. He doesn't talk about the Jews. He doesn't get into that whole Jewish Hebrew situation and the Hebrew should have been one of the people if he was going to write about somebody if he's going to write about a people the Hebrew should have definitely been a people that he really talked about extensively especially when you look at the Old Testament and how much they had supposedly have done in the ancient world the Hebrew should have been well known but Herodotus doesn't talk about him he talks about the ancient Egyptians he talks about Syria he talks about the uh, the Greeks he talks about so much, but he never mentions the Hebrews. Why is that? Because they did not exist. They didn't exist. Now, you would think if the Hebrews were in Egypt, then the Egyptians would have been talking about them. All the people would have been talking about what happened with part in the sea and, you know, the Jews being enslaved there. It would have been talked about, would have been known about the plagues and the people dying and everything that happened in the Old Testament would have been talked about, it would have been hieroglyphics of it, and Herodotus would have knew about it, and we have, he would have definitely spoken about it and written about it, but he didn't. So now, understand something. 
before the Persians invaded ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians was teaching mathematics and philosophy to the Ionians, to the Italians, and to a few other people who came into ancient Egypt. Now, we know that the ancient Egyptians was engaged in trade with a few people, with the Greeks, with the Ionians. I'm gonna get into that later. But there was teaching mathematics and philosophy. Now, we can go to Tales. We can go back to Tales, who was a Greek philosopher who was born in Miletus. Now, Miletus is in Ionia. Now, when you read down here, it says, uh, Tales used geometry to calculate the heights of the pyramids and the distance of ships from the shore. So, of course, he had to be in Egypt to, to do that. So, it's telling you. He was in Egypt. He could do what he did because he learned this from the ancient Egyptians. But who were the Ionians? The Ionians, is we're going to talk about them a lot because they play a major role in this whole thing. Who were the Ionians? Now, when we look up the Ionians, it says the Ionians were one of the four major tribes that the Greeks considered themselves divided into during the ancient period. Alongside Dorians, Aeolians, and Achaeans, the Ionian dialect was one of the three major linguistic divisions of the Hellenic world, together with the Dorian and Aeolian dialects. Now, if you read Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James, he talks about Ionia. He talks about how philosophy was stolen from the ancient Egyptians by the Greeks and passed off as Greek philosophy. Now on page 12, he says, the Ionians and Italians made no attempt to claim the authorship of philosophy because they were well aware that the Egyptians were the true authors. He goes on to say, for this reason, the so-called Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy, which first spread to Ionia, thence to Italy, and thence to Athens. And it must be remembered that at this remote period of Greek history, i.e. Tales to Aristotle, 640 BC to 322 BC, the Ionians were not Greek citizens, but at first, this is, the, this is the big part, at first Egyptian subjects and later Persian subjects. Now, when we look at the map, we can see where Ionia is. We know it's modern day Turkey. But at this time he's talking about, it was not yet part of the whole Greek territory. It later became part of Greece, and I'm going to get into that later. But the key part is, how did the Ionians become Egyptian subjects? He didn't say Egyptian citizens, he said Egyptian subjects. So how did they become Egyptian subjects? So according to Herodotus, and I'm going to paraphrase this story because there's a lot more to it, and to save time, I'm just going to paraphrase but according to Herodotus, Samtek I was stripped of his power and chased into the marshes by 11 kings that ruled inside of Egypt. Now, the reason why they did this is because they believed that Samtek I was going to become powerful enough to strip them of their power, and he was going to eventually rule all of Egypt by itself. So they chased him out of there. Now, he ended up getting mercenaries. He ended up getting help from mercenaries from the Ionians and from the Carians. Now, they helped him get rid of these kings, and he basically ruled all of Egypt. And they thanked them for helping him out. He gave the mercenaries land along the Pelusian arm of the Nile, and they settled there, and it was there for a long time. Now, Amos II, when he came into power, he moved the Ionians to Nacritus, Egypt. Now, he gave that city a lot of privileges. They had a free port there. They basically had a monopoly on international trade. He gave them land to build temples. They had their own assembly and their own administration. Now, the Ionians, along with the Dorians and the Aeolians, they built Hellenion, or Hellenion, which is basically a Greek sanctuary in Nacritus, Egypt. So understand, understand what I'm saying. The Greeks had a sanctuary in Egypt. This is something that they are not talking about. But the Greeks and the Carians also had a marketplace there. They had a marketplace in Bubasis and in Sais and in Memphis, Egypt, and lower Bubasis. So they were trading there. They had a marketplace. This is something that is not talked about about Egypt. They're not telling you about what really was going on there. Now, the Greeks that was in Egypt also sent silver to Greece to help with the reconstruction of the Temple of Delphi. 
Now, this is like history that is not being talked about. And it's crazy when I go and I start reading the Bible, when I start reading a lot of of uh, things that have to do with religion. This part of Egypt is not talked about. This history is not talked about because it destroys the validity of the Bible. And I'm going to get in and I'm going to show you this whole free port that I'm talking about. We're going to show you because this stuff has been proven. Herodotus wrote about this stuff and we found it. So as I said, the writings of Herodotus have been proven true time and time again. Now, a French archaeologist by the name of Frank Gaudio using the writings of Herodotus, found a sunken city in the Nile Delta. Now, this sunken city was called Heraklion by the Greeks and called Tanis by the ancient Egyptians. Now, and when they went to this, when they found this sunken city, I mean, it had a free port there. It had ships and they found boats. They've been pulling up statues and pulling up things for a long time from this place. But it just validates everything Herodotus is talking about when he's talking about these free ports and when he's talking about what they had at Nacritus. So it shows you that the Greeks was engaged in trade with the Egyptians and everybody knew about it, but nobody's talking about it because it destroys the validity of the Bible. It paints the ancient Egyptians in a whole different light when you start finding these things. Now, and I've been trying to get people to read the book Hebrew is Greek for years by Joseph Yehuda. Now, the book is $1,800, I understand that, but you can get a PDF. It's a little bit thinner, lighter. It's not as good as the actual book, but you can read it. Now, it's a reason why this book costs $1,800, that I want you to understand that the Hebrew language comes from Greek, and he proves 100% in this book that the Hebrew language comes from Greek. Greek. Now, there's a couple things and a couple points he wanted to make in this book. I want to read to you a few of them. Now, he says that Judean and Ashdodite were not more different one from the other than Hebrew is from Arabic or Aramaic. That the Jewish, the Christo European, and the Islamic cultures, the triple aspect of modern civilization, all originate from Hellas. That the Hebrews worship Greek gods and follow Greek customs. That Hebrew has a multiplicity of unsuspected dialects and homonyms. That many proper nouns in the Bible, whether divine, ethnic, geographical, or personal, resemble Greek proper nouns, while others have Greek adjectives and common nouns or homologues. That judging by the proportion of epic and poetic homologues and by the primitive grammatical structures to be found in the Bible, one is impelled to the conclusion that the ancestors of the Jews must have been among the noblest and or the most ancient of Hellens, and that they spoke a language far more ancient than classical Greek. That when the Hellenic affinity of the Phoenicians had long been forgotten, it was assumed that the identity of the Greek with the Phoenician alphabet was simply a matter of borrowing. Herodotus 5.58 he cites, so let's go to Herodotus 558 and look what Herodotus is saying. Herodotus, Herodotus says, These Phoenicians who came with Cadmus and whom the Jephirians were a part brought with them to Hellas, among many other kinds of learning, the alphabet, which had been unknown before this. I think to the Greeks, as time went on, the sound and the form of the letters were changed. At this time, the Greeks who were settled around them were, for the most part, Ionians. And after being taught the letters of the Phoenicians, they used them with a few changes of form. In doing so, they gave to these characters the name of Phoenicians, as well quite fair, seeing that the Phoenicians had brought them into Greece. The Ionians have also formed, from ancient times, called sheets of papyrus skins since they formerly used the skins of sheep and goats due to lack of papyrus. Even to this day, there are many foreigners who write on such skins. So now you have Herodotus sitting there talking about the Greek alphabet. He goes back to the Phoenicians. Now, does anybody pick up on the problem here? What are we missing? If you are talking about a sort of etymology of an alphabet, and you go back to the Phoenicians. How can he go to the Phoenicians? This is the key part. Herodotus never mentions the Hebrews. So if you're talking about 
where this language could have came from, how come Herodotus, he talks about the Phoenicians, he, talk about, he talks about the Ionians, but he doesn't talk about the Hebrews who we are told by the Israelites and by everybody else who believes in his Bible that the Hebrew language is the first language, that it all starts with Hebrew. So why is he not talking about Hebrew? Why does Herodotus never mentions the Hebrew? He doesn't talk about them because one, he died before the Greeks invaded Egypt and there was no such thing as a Hebrew at that time. And again, I know people are going to say, well, Greek mythology is not older than the Hebrews. I'm going to prove that. We're going to go through all that because you have to understand what's history and what's the Bible. The Bible is not proven history. So just because the Bible says so doesn't make it true. But we're going to go through that later. Okay, so understand. What Joseph Yehuda is saying is when he starts studying this Greek language, when he starts tracing the etymology back and going way back to the dialect and to the alphabet, that it fits with ancient Phoenician. So then he goes and cites Herodotus and Herodotus is backing it up saying, yeah, the Phoenicians brought this whole alphabet. Now understand, he said alphabet, he didn't say language. So they had to be speaking something before this alphabet because they obviously was, you know, conversing with the, with the Egyptians. So they obviously spoke uh, Egyptian or some kind of language. So it was obviously able to communicate with the Egyptians. So he's saying that the Phoenicians bring in this alphabet and teach them this alphabet. The Ionians had this alphabet, but they edited it. They changed it around a little bit to fit their dialect and they played with it and it came up with something different, which we know today is Greek. We call it Greek, but when you trace it back, it goes back to Phoenician. So he goes off of this and he does the same thing with Hebrew and he can trace it back. I mean, he does it very well in the book. He traces it back and it goes all the way back. You can see as he was saying about how homologs and certain things has just changed slightly to where you can tell this is the Greek language. He did all the homework, it's done. And other people as well follow his work. He actually already proved 90% of the letters in the alphabet goes back to Hebrew. He died before he could finish the other 10%, but other scholars picked up where he left off and proved the other 10%, proving 100% of the alphabet goes back to Greek. But if you don't do any research, you wouldn't know this. Herodotus backs it up. Everything backs it up and it goes back to the Ionians again. So again, let's look at this. Who are these Ionians? And when we go in to read again, it says the Ionians were one of the four major tribes that the Greeks considered themselves divided into. I know I read it already, I'm gonna read it again. During the ancient period alongside the Dorians, the Aeolians and the Achaeans, the Ionian dialect was one of the three major linguistic divisions of the Hellenic world together with the Dorian's Aeolian dialects. Remember, that's why he had to say the Aeolian dialects. It was a dialect. He's gone into the language. But when we scroll down, this, it, this is where it gets good because everybody's waiting for the whole where the Bible come into play part. When we scroll down, look at what it say. Biblical. In the book of Genesis, of the English Bible, Javan, is son of Japheth. Javan is believed nearly universally by Bible scholars to represent the Ionians. That is, Javan is Ion. So who is this Ion? Let's take a look. It says, according to Greek mythology, Ion was the illegitimate child of Creusia, daughter of Aretheus and wife of Zeus. Creusia conceived Ion with Apollo, then she abandoned the child. But let's scroll down here where I have highlighted. It says, Ion was also believed to have founded a primary tribe of Greece, the Ionians. He has often been identified with the Javan mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. Let's look some more about this Ion. Greek myth index. I got it highlighted down here, the part I wanted to show you. It says, however, her object was discovered for as Ion, before drinking, poured out a, li a libation to the gods, a pigeon which drank of it died on the spot. Creusia thereupon fled to the altar of the god. Ion dragged her away and was on the point of killing her when a priestess interfered, explained the mystery, and showed that Ion was the son of Creusia. Mother and son thus became reconciled, but Zeus 
was not let into the secret. The latter, however, was satisfied, for he too received a promise that he should become a father of, it says vis-a-vis, -vis, which basically means we're talking about Dorius and Achaeus. But who is Dorus and Achaeus? We're talking about the Dorians and the Achaeans, which is part of the four tribes of the Greeks, which makes up the Ionians, the Achaeans, the Aeolians, and the Dorians. So it says down here, it says, after the death of Selenus, Ion succeeded the throne, and thus the Aegeleans received the name of Ionians. Ionians and the town of Hellas was built in honor of Ion's wife. So here we go. We attaching Greek mythology to the Bible, but it's going to get deeper than this. It's going to go much deeper because I know a lot of people were saying, how is this older than Hebrew? And you got to remember that you're talking about a book. The Bible, it's a book. It's not proven history. We're not finding any ancient writings from the Hebrews that's predating Herodotus. We're not finding anything. If the, if the Hebrews did everything that the Bible spoke of, there is no way they would not have been mentioned by Herodotus and other scholars. I'm talking about before the time. I'm talking about during a Homeretic period, but we're going to get into all that. Okay, let's continue. It says, additionally, but less surely, Japheth may be related linguistically to the Greek mythological figure, Ipethus. Now it says, Ipethus. Also, Japhethus was a titan. Now, you scroll down, it says, Ipethus and Japheth. Ipethus has been equated with Japheth, the son of Noah, based on the similarities of their names and on old Jewish traditions that held Japheth as the ancestor of the Greeks, the Slavs, the Italics, the Teutons, and the Javadians. See Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews. So when we look at Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, I'm just going to give you this little reference that says down here, Javan, Ionians, Greek. That's the only thing we need to see. Now, I have shown you before in my last video about how much Greek mythology parallels the Old Testament. And you can go look at Eve and the Apple and look at Pandora's box. We can look at the whole Noah's Ark story and look at Deucalion and Pharaoh. You got Hercules, you got Samson. So it's a lot of other things. We can just look at the Old Testament. You can look at uh, God and Zeus or God and Kronos or Satan and Kronos. It's a lot of things we can compare Greek mythology with the Old Testament. Now, first thing you got to ask yourself is if the Greeks stole that from the Hebrews, then you will have to prove that they knew of the Hebrews before the time of Homer. You would have to prove that Homer could read Hebrew and that he knew about the Hebrews. You will not be able to do that. You will also have to prove that Greek mythology was not worshipped by the Greeks before the Greeks invaded uh, Egypt. You can't do that. We, we're going to go by proof in this video. I'm going to go by proof and what the proof tells us and what the facts tells us. Now, you can stick your head in the Bible and believe everything is in there. and You're going to be stuck just like these Hebrews is. But that's exactly what they're doing. You would sit there and believe, of course, Hebrew is older than Greek mythology. But it's not. And the, and the proof shows that it's not. So when we get into Greek mythology, how far back does it go? No one really knows, but we know it goes back at least to 1000 BCE because we can date the Lilad by Homer between the 11th century and the 8th century. We know that uh, Herodotus speaks of Homer, so we know that Homer was something that was talked about and he exists. Now, a lot of scholars, you know, debate about Homer and they think that the stories that he wrote about was just folklore. He was just the first one to put it into writing, but People talk about Homer. Herodotus speaks of him. But not just that, we can go to the British Museum. We can find artifacts from Greek mythology that dates between 480 and 400 BCE. We can look at the Temple of Zeus, which dates between 472 and 456 BCE. We can look at the Temple of Poseidon, 440 BCE. We can look at the Temple of Delphi, which is older. That goes from 548 BCE, where they held the Pantheon Games. This is where we get the Olympics. Now, you cannot find me an equivalent from Hebrew. Find me any Hebrew structures that's older than these. These are still around. The ruins are there. They existed. You will not find me any Hebrew structures or anything that existed that is older than what we see here in Greece. So we can't say that the Hebrews 
came before Greek mythology or the Old Testament came before Greek mythology because there is no proof. You can't back it up. You're going from a Bible. It's just a book. There is no proof. No proof to back it up whatsoever. So now, this is supposed to be the oldest example of Hebrew writing they found in Israel. Now, when you go to the National Geographic website where it talks about this piece of pottery that they found. Now, notice, this is the picture that you mostly see when you try to research this situation. They don't really give you a good look at the actual piece of pottery. Not a really, really, you know, good look. But, when you go to the website, it says here, oldest Hebrew text is evidence for Bible stories, question mark. Now the actual article goes on to say, the uh, exact nature of the text believed to be Hebrew, written in proto-Canaanite script, that's not Hebrew. A type of early alphabet has yet to be determined, but a number of words have already been translated, including judge, slave, and king. But the archeologist claims are disputed by an Israeli colleague who says that there is not enough scientific information to reach a definitive conclusion. So here comes this Israeli a Jew who said, no, this is not uh, Hebrew. We can't go ahead and just say it's Hebrew. There's not enough information to make a definitive claim. So you got a lot of people who was looking at this situation and just saying, no, it's not Hebrew. It's not Hebrew. Now they will lead you to believe. They always tell you it is believed to be. They will lead you to believe that it is Hebrew writing, but it's not. So why not just be honest and say this is not Hebrew? We should know definitively that it is. They have to make this connection and somehow put Hebrew in ancient Israel when that's not the case. We know the Egyptians was there. But when you go to the next page, it goes on to say, Tel Aviv University archaeologist Israel Finkelstein, who was not involved in the Ela excavations, agreed the site is very important, but has significant concerns with Garfinkel's interpretation of the findings. Immediately drawing ties between the site and the kingdom of Judah is a mistake, he said, and it might as well have been Philistine in origin. Also, due to the small number of samples, the carbon-14 dating of the site is also not as precise as it should be, he added. We need to wait for more samples. It's not enough to date the site based on two olive pits, he said, because that's what they use to, to carbon-14 date a piece of pottery. So how are you going to use olive pits when, you when we're talking about Hebrew writing? Well, that's how they do. Now, he goes on to say he also expresses doubts about the counterpiece of Garfinkel's finding the text. I am prepared to predict that it will be very difficult to determine whether the text is in fact Hebrew. There will be evidence indicating various possibilities, he said. And the nature of its discovery, this piece of pottery, is also not unusual. There is a group of late proto-Canaanite pottery shards from the same chronological phase that have been found in various sites on the coastal plains. None of them were discovered in Judea proper. So here comes this other uh, archaeologist who's saying that they jumping the gun on this and it's not Hebrew. So when we go back and we try to start finding ancient Hebrew writings, you're going to always only find a piece of pottery or a shard or something on like a wooden bar, something that a little a four year old could carve into a board. Now, if you get a piece of pottery, if you get something that's old, you can carve whatever you want into it and say it's Hebrew. You need to find stuff like we found with the Greeks. You need to find civilizations. You need to find like whole documentation. It's so unbelievable to me that these people are supposed to have existed for so long. They're supposed to have existed for so long and done so much, yet there is so little about them. The ancient Egyptians are so old. Look how much we have on them. Look how much we have on the Greeks. We got a lot of information. We have structures. We have bodies. We have everything. But you can't find nothing when it comes to these ancient Hebrews, who's supposed to be ancient. Their writing is supposed to be older than the Phoenicians, supposed to be the first writing. But yet, they keep trying to mix in the Hebrew language with the Phoenician, when it should be the other way around. But you can't find any Hebrew. Now, they want to sit there and tell us that, well, God destroyed Jerusalem, or he destroyed Israel like 20 times in the Bible, when a lot of the information got lost. But what if he did that, why do we have so much of Egyptian uh, artifacts that we found in uh, Israel? Why do we have so much proof? of Egyptians being in Israel, but not actual Hebrews. 
Now, of course, when I say not actual Hebrews, I mean during ancient times. But they want us to believe that this piece of pottery goes all the way back to the time of King David. Now, we're talking 1000 BCE to 800 BCE, somewhere in that time frame. But of course, there was no such thing as a King David. Now, we are told in the Bible, when you read Samuel uh, chapter 5, 6 through 10, it says that um, King David basically gave the name Jerusalem to Jerusalem that before he took over Jerusalem, that it was called Jebus and the Jebusites was there. So you would have to prove that Jerusalem first was called Jebus before that time and that there was a people called the Jebusites. You will not be able to do that. When we go look it up, this is what we find. So it says here, the siege of Jebus. And you go down here, it says, now Peter Lynch notes that every non-biblical mention of Jerusalem found in the ancient Near East refers to the city with the name Jerusalem, offering an example, the Armana letters, which are dated to the 14th century BCE and calls Jerusalem, the Rashlamu. He states that there is no evidence of Jebus or the Jebusites outside of the Old Testament. Some scholars reckon Jebus to be a different place from Jerusalem. Other scholars prefer to see the name of Jebus as a kind of pseudo-ethnic name without any historical background. So here it is. He's saying that nobody has found anything that refers to a Jebus or these uh, Jebusites. There is no such thing. The people never existed, period. You got to understand history doesn't lie. You can go ahead and believe this one book if you want. When you go do the actual research, you can't find these people. So now when you read Samuel chapter 5, 6 through 10, when it's talking about King David taking over uh, Jebus from the Jebusites and never mentions anything about any Egyptians being there. Doesn't speak about Egyptians, but we know the ancient Egyptians was there. We know there was in Israel and ruling Israel around that time because we found artifacts dating back to that time. Now, when you look at the artifacts that they found in Israel, we know that it is proof that the ancient Egyptians was there. So when you go to it, this is an article from Artnet News. It's talking about these artifacts. It says, more than 300 ceramic artifacts were excavated from a cave in Najib. Now that's South Israel. Most of them in astonishingly good condition. Archaeologists also unearthed dozens of jewelry items made of bronze, shell, and faience, uh, as well as unique stone tools made of yellowish alabaster, seal rings, and makeup flakons, all dating back to 1500 to 1000 BC. It goes on to say, most of the scarab seals found in the excavation date to the 15th and 14th century BC. Dr. Daphne Bentor, Daphne Bentor, curator of Egyptian archaeology at the Israel Museum, explained, during this period, Canaan was under Egyptian rule, she said. Now, we already know that the ancient Egyptians and the Canaanites have a history that goes back to the Bronze Age. Now, I want to read to you an article from the University of Pennsylvania. They have a museum there of archaeology and anthropology, and they also have a large collection of Egyptian artifacts. So it says here on the website, Canaan and ancient Israel. It says for more than 300 years during the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age, Egypt ruled Canaan. Deities, arts and technology were intermingled between the two cultures. The Egyptian culture developed alongside Canaan and ancient Israel for thousands of years. Early on in its history, Egypt was unified under the rule of a single king or pharaoh in the old kingdom of Egypt. Now, it gives you a date, 2675 to 2130 BCE. So where are the Hebrews? At this time, where are the Hebrews? We're talking about the ancient Egyptians and the Canaanites uniting. So... If the Hebrews was there first, because they'll tell you the Hebrews was there before the Canaanites, but where are they? Now, they wasn't being enslaved at this time. They wasn't in Egypt at this time. Where the hell are they at this time period? But we're talking about here, the Canaanites and the uh, ancient Egyptians at this time frame. We can't find these people. So the Bible tells us that the Israelites was enslaved in Egypt because they was basically growing in numbers. They was growing in strength. And the Pharaoh, who didn't know Joseph, he enslaved them instead of throwing them out of there because he believed they would end up taking over. Now, the Bible also talks about a prophecy that God gave Abraham saying that this would happen. Now, they basically got this story from what happened between the ancient Egyptians and the Canaanites. Now, we go back to this article. It goes on to say 
The peace and prosperity of the old kingdom ended in years of civil war and discord, 2130 to 1980 BCE, known as the first intermediate period. The Pharaoh Mentuhotep II eventually re, uh, reunited Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt to begin the Middle Kingdom. 1980 to 1630 BCE. It goes on to say turmoil once again boiled in Egypt as the Hyksos, foreigners of Canaanite origin, took control of Lower Egypt in the second intermediate period, 1630 to 1539 BCE. So now understand what happened here. This is where they kind of got the story from. So you have the Hyksos who are of Canaanite origin coming into Egypt or coming into territories of the Egyptians and basically getting into skirmishes with the Egyptians. So the Egyptians realized these people were of Canaanite descent. So they basically said, all you Canaanites, y'all got to go. Y'all got to get out of here. So if you're going to stay, any Canaanites who stay, you have to follow Egyptian rules. It's going to be a curfew. You got to follow Egyptian customs and culture and stuff like that, or else you got to go. So they believe a lot of those people who left end up joining the Hyksos and coming back and eventually taking over uh, Lower Egypt. I also understand that the Hyksos are believed to be of mixed race, that they are half Canaanite and half something else or Canaanite and something else. We can't figure out who exactly they was mixed with, but most scholars believe that they were of mixed race and half of them was a Canaanite. Now, let's go back to this article down here. It says in 1456 BCE, Pharaoh Thutmose III won a decisive battle against a coalition of Canaanite rulers at Megiddo. Now understand, Megiddo is basically northern Israel. This is basically what the Greeks call Armageddon. That's where they get it from. Armageddon comes from here. Now, the great Pharaoh recorded his triumph in Egypt, and you know, uh, he talked about this. But understand, 1456 uh, BCE, 1456 BCE, we're talking about when was the exodus now the date that they give us for the exodus is between 1446 bce and you know maybe uh 1250 bce now i'm not saying any of the dates that i use i'm not saying that all israelites agree on it because it's one of the things that smart hebrews don't do they don't give you any dates because the dates never fit with anything but you got to date something so we're going to go with the official dates that they give us and it's 1446 bce and maybe uh, 1250 BCE, but we know that's not true. The problem with these dates is this. The date of 1446 BCE puts the Exodus during the rule of Thutmose III. So that would be weird that a man named Moses actually freed Hebrews from Egypt during the reign of a pharaoh named Thutmose. So that's kind of suspect right there. Another thing is this. The Bible doesn't speak of Thutmose III. You would think that they would know the Pharaoh's name and put it in the Bible. It does speak of Ramses. Now, the whole problem with Ramses being the Pharaoh under the Exodus is he wasn't Pharaoh in 1446 BCE. So let's go to the second date, which is 1250 BCE. But we know that he wasn't Pharaoh at that time as well. His reign ended at 1213 BCE. So who were they enslaved under? The reason why they want to use Ramses is because when you go to Egypt, when you look at the hieroglyphics, you can see Ramses bashing the skulls of what looks like uh, slaves and chasing down and running people over in his chariot, just the way to describe the Pharaoh in the Bible. But what they don't tell you is these were the Hittites. They were not slaves. Uh, there was not Jewish slaves. There was not Hebrews. These was the Hittites that you see in those hieroglyphics. They also point to hieroglyphics that show people that look like they are in bondage, look like they are slaves, but they don't tell you that this was during the Hyksos reign. And most of the people you see in slaves were the Egyptians themselves. So even if they was enslaved under Thutmose III, and they let's say the Exodus happened, they wandered for 40 years, they would still end up in Egyptian territory under Egyptian rule. Even if they was enslaved under Ramses and they wandered for 40 years and then ended up in Israel, they would still be under Egyptian rule. We know for a fact that the Egyptians were still ruling Phoenicia. We know that uh, Ramses III lost it in 1156 BCE. So this will be, you, you can factor in a time and the Egyptians are still there. We found artifacts showing that they were still in Israel during that time. We know they was there. We can't find any proof of this whole exodus of the Israelites being in Israel during that time period, 
Nobody knows, which means it never happened. So let's start bringing all this thing together because I'm going to show you what has taken place in this history. And you can piece it together when you start going back and looking at certain things. Now, this whole thing really begins with the rule of the Ptolemies. Everything starts when the Greeks take over Egypt. Now, we know that the Persians conquered the Phoenicians, and when they did so, they amassed an army large enough to go ahead and conquer the Egyptians. Now, after they conquered the Egyptians, they went on into Ionia to conquer the Ionians, but the Ionians got help. It says, in 498 BC, supported by troops from Athens and Eritrea, the Ionians marched on, captured, and burnt Sardis. However, on their return journey to Ionia, they were followed by Persian troops and decisively beaten at the Battle of Ephesus. So now you had the Persians going into Ionia. They was getting help from the Greeks, but they still managed to conquer the Ionians. Now, later on, there is the first because the Greeks helped the Ionians. They went on and marched into Greece to try to conquer the Greeks. But the Greeks beat them at the Battle of Marathon. And this is the whole reason why Alexander and the Greeks went on into Egypt to conquer Darius I and wipe out the um, Persians inside of Egypt. So now we're talking about the Greeks conquering Egypt. They have control over Egypt. Understand, they actually conquered Israel before they came into Egypt. So Alexander the Great died 323 BCE. Then we get the rule of the Ptolemy. The whole Ptolemaic era begins here. Now understand in history, as far as history is concerned, this is where the Old Testament comes from. We don't get no Old Testament without the Ptolemies, without the Greeks, period. So when you, when you try to trace it back to the origin, we're talking about the beginning of the Old Testament. Officially, when you go back and look at the story, it goes back to the Septuagint. And according to history, how did we get the Septuagint? How did the Septuagint come about? This all goes back to the letters of Orestes and LXX. This is how this whole thing supposed to have begun. Now understand, we don't have the original Hebrew version of the Old Testament. We don't have it. So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we get the Septuagint. So we got to see where did the Septuagint come from and how did the whole thing come about? And for that, we point to the letters of Orestes. So now understand, the letters of Orestes is just as suspect as the Tanakh. It's just as suspect as the Old Testament. The only difference is we can actually look at the letters of Orestes and trace it back to a people that have a proven history that we can see. We can actually trace it back to a people who was you know, proven and has a history. We know about the Ptolemies. We know they existed. We can prove it. As with the Tanakh, we can't prove the existence of Moses. We can't prove the existence of these people. We can't prove what the Old Testament is saying. So as far as the Old Testament, the history of it lies within the book itself. We can't go outside of it and validate it, period. But what this letters of arrest is, we can do this. Now, I'm not saying that it's correct because it's obviously not. And a lot of scholars, every serious scholar agrees that the letters of arrest is, is bogus. And I'm going to get into that later. But the whole thing about the letters of Orestes is talking about how the Septuagint came into place. So basically it's saying that, you know, the, the librarian of Ptolemy, uh, the first Philadelphia, it's basically said we need a Greek version of the Hebrew law. So he tells Ptolemy and Ptolemy basically spends all this money and frees a whole bunch of slaves to get the Jews to make this copy for him to, to go ahead and do this translation. So he gets six elders from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to come to Alexandria, Egypt to do the whole translation. So, you know, Septuagint means 70, but it's really 72 people who basically translated the whole thing, you know, in 72 days, according to the letters of Orestes. Now, when you start reading the letters of Orestes, the librarian is trying to convince Ptolemy that he should release some of the Jews in order for them to get the uh, Jews in Israel to actually do this whole translation. Now, he goes on to say that, you know, you release some of them, it'd be like a good favor, it'd be a good thing for them, it'd be basically a good look. And that he basically goes on to say that we all have the same God, except that we call our God Zeus. So when you start reading it, he's trying to convince Ptolemy, and Ptolemy eventually agrees. That's the beginning of the letters of Orestes. He's explaining what's going on and what happened and what led up to the whole thing. It's in very, very good detail, which is why it's suspect and why a lot of people don't believe it. It's too many details in it for somebody to write it out like that. So 
when you go on to read it, it's basically, you know, the whole thing is suspect and it goes against the history that's proven. So the whole thing is, if the letters of Orestes is correct, then I mean, the rest of history, as we know, is wrong. Because when you look at the whole war between the Persians and the Egyptians and the Greeks, it basically, the letter basically goes against everything we know and prove about that war. It goes against it. So if the letters is correct, then it goes against history and history is wrong. So that can't be. But if it's false, then it basically proves that the Greeks went on ahead and created the Old Testament. It gives a lot of validity to that story. Okay, so Letters of Orestes. In this part, I want to read real quick because I believe it's an important part. It's a very long letter. There's a lot to it. So if you get a chance someday, go online and find it and read it and study it. Because when you start to compare it with actual history, when you start to compare it with the Bible too, and we start to compare it with what we know, then it, you know it, stuff doesn't fit. Things doesn't it don't work out when <laughs> when you start to compare it to what we know. So it says here, go down to uh, Letters of Orestes, start at thirty five. It says, King Ptolemy sends greetings and salutations to High Priest Alizar, since there are many Jews settled in our realm who are carried off, who were carried off from Jerusalem by the Persians at the time of their power, and many more who came with my father unto Egypt as captives. Large numbers of these he placed in the army and paid them higher wages than usual. Now understand what he's saying here. He's saying that he took Jews. Now let's go to the Hebrew Israelite you know, definitions of Jews. According to them, they were black. They were black people. Like I said, I don't, I'm not disputing that. But according to this letter, we talk about the white Greeks took black Jews and put them into his army to fight against black Egyptians. This is what this letter is saying. So it goes on to say, and when he had proved the loyalty of their leaders, he built fortresses and placed them in their charge that the native Egyptians might be intimidated by them. And I, when I ascended the throne, adopted a kindly attitude towards all of my subjects and more particularly to those who were citizens of yours. You know, he's basically kissing the high priest's ass here, and it doesn't sound like setting up a Ptolemy and do. He's basically saying, hey, I liked your people. This is what happened. And, you know, I, I gave him jobs and I did this. And he's kissing his ass trying to get this thing done. But we got to realize that they had already conquered Israel. They under the rule of, of the Greeks. So why all this ass kissing? So let's keep going. I have set at liberty more than 100,000 captives paying their owners the appropriate market price for them. And if ever evil has been done to your people through the passion of the mob, I have made them reparations. The motive which prompted my action has been the desire to act poisonly and render unto the supreme God a thank offering for maintaining my kingdom in peace and great glory in all the world. Moreover, those of your people who were in the prime of their life, prime of life, I have drafted into my army, and those who were fit to be attached to my person and worthy of the confidence of the court, I have established an official position. Now, since I am anxious to show my gratitude to these men and to the Jews throughout the world and to the generations yet to come, I have determined that your law shall be translated from Hebrew tongue, which is in use amongst you, into Greek language, that these books may be added to the other royal books in my library. So he's saying basically what I said, that we want this whole thing translated. But understand, for this translation, he's given up a lot. Now, if you get a chance to read the letter, I'm going to go through the detail, but it goes in details of the wealth, all the gold and everything that he gives them for doing this. That's one thing. And 100,000 slaves he released, and he pays all the people who own slaves. Now, understand, Ptolemy II, Philadelphia. Now, now, I may have said Ptolemy I before. I just thought about that. If I said that, understand there's a lot of information going on in my head. I'm trying to get it out fast. And let me say this also. I know I give you guys a lot of sources and I read from a lot of things, but I try to find sources online so I can show you where my information is coming from instead of giving you a lot of book references. I understand a lot of people can't afford to buy some of these expensive books. So I try to find sources as many sources as I can to show you guys so you can so you can understand that I'm not just saying this. I'm not just making this stuff up and it's not just, you know, coming from Merkaba. 
It's not just coming from me. It's coming from sources and books that I've read. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of references and show you a lot of books, but I want you to be able to, you know, hop on your phone and go online and find these references and find these sources so you can get this information as well. And I have to order a book and wait for it to come. And, you know, by then you probably didn't forget all about the whole situation. So I try to give you as many references as well. Now, that being said, Ptolemy II in Philadelphia, he actually made a law basically saying that, um, if you don't turn in your slaves, like if you don't turn in your slaves and get this money, that if somebody snitches on you and there'll be a trial, they'll basically put you on trial. And if you are found guilty, you will become the slave of the person who snitched on you. So that's kind of crazy. So, you know, there's a whole big debate about, you know, what if the slaves have kids? Are you going to give us the same amount for each kid? You know, so Ptolemy II ended up saying, yeah, we'll give you the same amount for each kid. So a lot of people was getting rich off of, you know, these slaves, according to the letters of Orestius. You know, it's another thing that makes it suspect because it's like, why give up so much money? Why free a hundred thousand slaves, all this to get a translation when you could have just forced the translation and, you know, you could have just made them do a road translation and then got, you know, a Jew snitch or got somebody who actually spoke Hebrew to validate it. But he gives up so much. And then later on, you know, the whole letter is contradicted by the actions of uh, the next Ptolemy. You know, the whole Greek uh, Hellenistic age is all contradicted by that. So it doesn't support what uh, this letters of Orestes is, is saying. But it's also suspect that you would free some slaves that go on ahead and make a law that's going to make your own citizen slaves if they don't agree with it. You know, it's all suspect and a lot of scholars disagree with it. So now at some point, these letters of Orestes ends up in Jewish hands. We know Josephus talks about the letters of Orestes. But now a lot of scholars didn't agree with the whole thing and thought it was bogus. And it says here, Demetros of Phileron, a client of Ptolemy I Soter, is not a good candidate as a collaborator with Ptolemy II Philadelphia. Now, this Demetros is basically the librarian who I told you about, who went to Ptolemy II and said, hey, we need to get this whole thing in the library. We need to get this translation done. So listen to what he's saying. He's saying uh, Roger S. Bagnell notes that he made a strategic mistake at the beginning of the reign of supporting Ptolemy's older half-brother and was punished with internal exile dying soon after. So he's saying that you know, this dude is not even a good candidate to put into this whole story because he died. He wasn't even really cool with Ptolemy II in Philadelphia. For P Ptolemy to go ahead and give up 100,000 slaves and all these, all this gold and everything. So the whole thing is suspect just on that alone. And according to this dude, he was dead. So now another uh, critic says here, uh, physiological analysis by Louis Vives or Vives proposed that the pseudepigraphic letter was a forgery being written by an author living half a century after Ptolemy II Philadelphia, 285 to 246 BC, and assuming the name of Orestius, the inconsistencies and anachronisms of the author examined and exposed first by Humphrey Huda, uh, 1659 to 1706, placed the writings closer to 170 to 130 BCE. So now that's like huge because these things supposed to have been written. You're talking about during the time of Ptolemy II in Philadelphia, which is like way before this date here. Now it goes on to say here, uh, this is Bruce, Bruce Metzger. He writes, most scholars who have analyzed the letters have concluded that the author cannot have been the man he represented himself to be but was a Jew who wrote a fictitious account in order to enhance the importance of the Hebrew scriptures by suggesting that a pagan king had recognized the, their significance uh, and therefore arranged for their translation into Greek. So he's saying this whole thing was uh, basically a whole setup by the Jews. They made this whole letter up to give validity to the Hebrew version of the Old Testament because we know the Septuagint is in Greek and we know the Masoretes, they didn't agree with this whole thing and the whole Masoretic text, which came about later, we're talking about uh, 7th century to 10th century CE. Now the Masoretes went on ahead and created the Masoretic text, which is the Old Testament in Hebrew. This is where the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex comes from. They use the Masoretic text to, uh, to reference. Now, 
Let me go into what really happened here in Israel. Let's look at the truth and what the information, what the proof is telling us. Now, we know for a fact that the ancient Egyptians was already in Israel. No other civilization to this date has ruled Israel longer than the ancient Egyptians. That's a fact. Nobody has ruled it longer than them. It has changed rule of so many different civilizations and people, but the Egyptians overall had a longer reign or was in Israel longer than anybody else. That's what the facts is telling us. So now, when the Persians came and conquered Egypt, there were still Egyptians in Israel. When the Greeks came and conquered the Persians and took over Israel, there were still Egyptians in Israel. They were still there. Now remember, we know that Israel was part of the ancient Egyptian kingdom. They ruled Israel for hundreds of years. There was a lot of Egyptians there. So even by the time the Persians came in, there still wasn't many Egyptians. Now, after the wars or, you know, during the wars, maybe some Egyptians may have escaped into Egypt or into lower Africa. But for the most part, there was a lot of Egyptians still there in Israel. Now, what happened was the Greeks came along when they conquered, they brought Hellenism. This is what Hellenism was all about. It was trying to get people to abide by the Greek laws and worship Greek gods. And the, the Greeks came up with all kinds of stuff during this time, this whole Hellenistic period. Now, they would have you believe, they want you to believe that, that these people in Israel during this time are Jews. They are the Jews when they are not. They are clearly African people. They are clearly Egyptians. They want you to believe that the Hebrews came out of nowhere. The Jews been there for a long time. And all of a sudden, you know, the Africans or the Egyptians just basically disappear and then now you have Jews. When history is not telling us this is what happened. History is not saying this is what happened. Where did they come from? Where did the Egyptians go and the Hebrews come from in history? So you will have to show me in history, I'm talking about outside of the Bible, where the Egyptians left Israel and the Hebrews came in. Or show me in history outside of the Bible where Hebrews actually conquered Israel during the time of the ancient Egyptians rule of Israel or during the time of the Persians or the Greeks. You can't find that. So common sense to tell you there was no such thing as these people. They had to be made up because they don't fit nowhere in history. So we talk about they're supposed to be of the line of Shem, right? According to the Hebrews. But even the Bible tells you the Bible doesn't give you that much information on these people, on this whole Shemitic race or the Shemitic tribe doesn't talk about them. They come out of nowhere. The Bible even tells you that they basically conquer all the land that the uh, the descendants of the of Ham basically set up. So whenever the Hamites go somewhere and they set up a civilization, then uh, the race of Japheth, the descendants of Japheth and the descendants of Shem come and just basically conquer it, which is what the Bible was about. And I'm going to get into that later. So where did these Hebrews come from? History is not telling us that they was there at all. This whole thing, as I said, starts with the Greeks. So now when we go back, we find Hellenistic Judaism. And Hellenistic Judaism completely contradicts the letters of Orestius. Because in the letters of Orestius, the whole theme of Greece was basically to free the Jews, get this whole translation done. Because they basically said, hey, we all worship the same God. We just call them different names and everything is cool. But Hellenism is basically contradicting all that. Because Hellenism is basically trying to force these Jews to worship Greek gods and follow Greek customs. Now, understand the Greeks actually ruled Israel during this time. So how could Hellenism and Judaism coexist? They could have just tore down all the temples and forced the people to worship Greek gods. And that's basically what happened, except that there was no Judaism. Judaism was created by the Greeks, but they have to put it together to make it seem like they both was there at the same time. When, when you really think about it, it doesn't make any sense for them to be there at the same time. So listen, it says Hellenistic Judaism was a form of Judaism in the ancient world that combined Jewish religious traditions with elements of Greek culture until the fall of the Roman Empire and the Muslim conquest. Now, listen. That is very important right there. It says until the fall of the Roman Empire. Why till the fall of the Roman Empire and not the Greek Empire? Understand that the Romans came along and they obviously continued with this whole Hellenistic theme. Why? 
That is the key point. A lot of people is not putting that together that when the Romans conquered the Greeks, you know, they got the whole Greco-Roman era. That's why they put them together because they obviously figured something out. So what happened is you have Hellenism. So what is Hellenism? What is this whole Hellenistic rule? You have the Greeks trying to force a culture onto a people. So if you're trying to force a culture and a religion onto a people and you are the ruling elite, why would you allow those people to practice their own religion when you're trying to get them to practice yours? So it don't make sense for Hellenism to allow Judaism to exist when the Greeks are the rulers, if you understand what I'm trying to say. So it doesn't make sense that this whole Judaism was going on because Hellenism was a religion. They had a Hellenistic religion and it was the worship of Greek gods and Serapis. So let's go here and check this out. It says Hellenistic religion. Hellenistic religion is any of the various systems of beliefs and practices of the people who lived under the influence of the ancient Greek culture during the Hellenistic period and the Roman Empire. So understand, it's talking about this is Rome and Greece allowing this to go on. Now, when I finish reading this and as I'm reading it to people who are in and know, if you study a lot, I think a light bulb will go off in a lot of your heads. For those of you who understand the astrology and the mathematics that's in the Bible, this is going to make a lot more sense to you. So it gives a date here, 300 BCE to 300 CE. There was much continuity in Hellenistic religion. The Greek gods continued to be worshipped and the same rites were practiced as before. So if they practice in the same things, they practice in worshiping the Greek gods. So why would they allow Judaism to continue? It didn't exist yet, obviously. Uh, change came from the addition of the new religions from other countries, including the Egyptian deities, Isis and Serapis. And we know Serapis was basically created by Ptolemy. Uh, and the Syrian god of a targetist and Hadad, which provided a new outlet for people seeking fulfillment in both the present life and the afterlife. The worship of Hellenistic rulers was also a feature of this period, most notably in Egypt, where the Ptolemies adopted their early pharaonic practice and established themselves as God kings. Understand that God kings, they wanted to be God kings. They wanted to be worshiped. They didn't like the fact that these black people was worshiping these black gods and that white people was worshiping these black gods. So they wanted to be God kings. This is where whole Serapis thing come from. And when you look at Serapis, he looks like Jesus. He looks like Zeus. This is where it starts out at. Elsewhere, rulers might receive divine status without a full status of a God. Magic was practiced widely, and this too was a continuation from earlier times. Throughout the Hellenistic world, people would consult oracles and use charms and figurines to deter misfortune or to cast spells. Also developed in this era was the complex system of astrology, which sought to determine a person's character and fortune in the moments of the sun, moon, and planets. I'm going to stop right there. This is important to understand because a lot of people don't realize that they knew about this stuff. A lot of people think way back then, even though they see the pyramids and they see what the Egyptians did, they think these people was just super primitive and they didn't know nothing. They knew about all this stuff and you can see it in the Bible for those of you who are in the know. You know what's there. You know what Genesis is talking about. You know what Adam and Eve is really about. And I'm going to get into that. So it's showing you that these people knew about this. They understood what was going on. And it was trying to get these people in Israel to worship these gods. But obviously, they were not. So what did they do? They created the Old Testament and forced this, this, this whole religion on these people. Since you know about Serapis, since you know about Zeus and everybody like that, we're going to have to get some of these black leaders who basically are in Israel. We're going to have to bring them to our side and get them to teach this whole thing to the other people to get them to learn this whole Old Testament. That's how it started. Whether you want to accept it or not, and I'm going to continue on and get into more proof, more sources and everything. But that's what happened because they wouldn't accept Serapis. They wouldn't accept them. They wouldn't accept Zeus. They wouldn't accept none of this stuff. Which is why you find Greek mythology in the Old Testament, as I was showing you before. We're going to switch it up and we're going to create this whole religion and we're still going to get y'all to worship it. We're going to force it on y'all. We just ain't going to tell y'all what it is. 
Now, another people who I don't want to forget is the Assyrians and the Babylonians. We know, just like the Ionians, just like the Canaanites, that the Assyrians and the Babylonians was coming into Egypt, coming into Israel, and trading with the Egyptians. We know this because we have the artifacts to prove it. When you look at all these artifacts and you start going through them, you can see the Egyptian influence. You can see we have artifacts from these people in abundance. Look at this Eye of Horus. This is made by an Assyrian, but we know it's Egyptian. So it proves that they were coming in there and they were learning from the Egyptians and the Egyptians was influencing them in many ways. Look at the writing, look at the carvings in the stone. So they was picking up a lot. Now, we know that the Assyrians and the Babylonians was into was in Israel because we found artifacts that was attributed to the Assyrians and the Babylonians in Israel. The only artifacts we don't find is artifacts of the Hebrews. We have all of these artifacts that we can point towards the Egyptians, towards the Babylonians, towards the Assyrians, but nothing for the Hebrews. But since they know that the Assyrians and the Babylonians was in Israel, they gotta try to attach themselves to the Assyrians and the Babylonians. So that's why we find them in the Bible and it's talking about the uh, Assyrians taking the um, the Hebrews and, and uh, you know, deporting them to Mesopotamia, or, or, or deporting them to Babylon. But let's get real, what is really the Assyrians and the Babylonians? You, you're basically talking about North Mesopotamia, South uh, Mesopotamia, we're talking about the same people. We're talking about the Assyrians and the Babylonians in the same area, which is basically modern day Iraq. Now, the Jews always try to attach themselves to a people, or the Hebrews in the Bible, it's always attaching themselves to a people that we know existed, that we have proof of their existence. They do this to try to give validity to themselves but we can never find them. So they're always attaching themselves from people, from person to person to person, but somehow never leaving any traits. They try to do this to give validity to their story, but it's all bullshit. So now we know eventually the Greeks got the people in Israel to accept this doctrine. They got them to accept this whole Judaism. But as the religion began to spread into places like Syria and other places, what happened? The whole war broke out between them and the Romans. And we know the Romans won and conquered the Greeks. This began this whole Greco-Roman era. Now, we don't know if the Romans knew what was taking place with this whole Hellenization uh, going on in Israel. We don't know if they knew about the doctrine straight away, but at some point they figured it out because they let Hellenization continue. We know it, can, it continued under the Romans. Now, why would they do that? So a lot of people would say that, well, you know, Hellenization and the whole Judaism was separate, but we know it cannot possibly be separate because if you're trying to push a religion onto a people, you're not going to let them have a religion of their own, you know, as I said before. But the Romans allowed this whole thing to continue. Now, the one thing the Romans did because they were smart was like, well, you can't just have these uh, people in Israel believing in this doctrine. We got to get everybody else. So they got to get their own people. You got to get the Greeks to start becoming Jews and believing in this whole Jewish doctrine. So Judaism spread into Greece, of course. Now we know today the oldest Jewish synagogue in the world is in Greece. It's in Delos, Greece, and it's about, it dates back to 150 to, to about 120 BCE. So we know that was around the time when the Romans was conquering the Greeks. Now, the whole thing you got to remember is this. The Old Testament they was using back then is not the same as the one we have today. It was completely different. Now, this is the reason why when they show you the Dead Sea Scrolls, they don't give you a complete version. They give you a bunch of fragments and a bunch of little shards and papers saying that this is all we have. They found over 800 manuscripts in those caves, and they can't give you a complete copy of the Old Testament because it's different from the one you have today. Now, we know about the Jewish war that uh, Josephus writes about. The reason why that war started is because the Jews in Israel believed that their doctrine was being fulfilled, that their prophecy was coming true, and they had a warrior that was going to lead them to victory against the Romans or against their oppressors, who happened to be the Romans. So they attacked the Romans, and we know what happened. Titus Flavius destroyed the Jewish temple and he left with a bunch of their writings and he left with a bunch of basically war trophies. And that's why the Arch of Titus is in Rome today. 
depicting what happened back then. So we're talking around between 66 and 70 AD. This is when they are, this is when they believe the Dead Sea Scrolls was hidden right around this time. Now I went through this in my last video, but understand once the Jews lost this battle with the Romans, you got to think about it. If they really believed that they was fulfilling some kind of prophecy, if they believed that they had a Messiah or they had a warrior that was going to lead them to victory against their oppressors, when that didn't happen, of course, a lot of the Jews would lose faith. A lot of the people would start doubting their doctrine. So this was the opportunity that the Romans used to basically go ahead and instill a new doctrine. Now, this is why a lot of scholars believe that uh, Josephus was really just the writing name of Arius Piso because the Piso family had actually put together a doctrine that they was waiting to, you know, put into place. They already had something ready. They had a doctrine ready to go. So now this also gave the Romans the opportunity to make it so that they are looked upon more favorably. So we know that the Caesars wanted to be worshipped as gods. We know that the Greeks wanted to be looked upon more favorably as well because they came up with the Old Testament and it was getting ready to come up with the New Testament. So they made it so they were both looked upon more favorably, which is why we find the Greeks and the Romans all in the New Testament. I don't know how that's not suspect to so many people when you start doing this research. That is highly suspect to me. So now what do you tell these Hebrews after their whole prophecy was not fulfilled, they was defeated? You tell them it's their fault. You tell them they messed up. They broke God's covenant or some something to that effect. So when you go on and read Hebrews 8, uh, 6 through 9, it says, But now have he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established under better promises, upon better, better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So now all this stuff is going on between, we're talking 66 AD and about 160 AD, around the first and second century, you got this whole Jewish war happening, you got the New Testament coming into play, and everything is changing between the, uh, the Jews and the Greeks and the Christians now and the Jews. Because the whole thing is, of course, a lot of these Jews did not accept this whole New Testament, which is why today we still have Judaism and Christianity. A lot of them wasn't buying into it. Now, the reason why a lot of it wasn't buying into it was because of what St. Jerome did when he created the Latin Vulgate. He changed a lot of the Septuagint, and he basically said he did so because he was trying to correct the Hebrew. Now, the Masoretes was like the biggest critics of the Greek Old Testament and New Testament. They believe it all should be in Hebrew, and nobody can really fathom why the New Testament was in Greek, and Jesus was supposed to have spoken Aramaic or Hebrew or whatever. So it was suspect. So now you gotta think about it in terms of, let's look at today. We got the Old Testament today, we got the New Testament. So what if somebody came out with another Testament of the Bible today? Like a whole Testament and they wanted to add it on, you know, something after our New Testament. Now, our New Testament has revelations when everything's supposed to end. So let's say this whole next Testament, let's call it, comes along and, you know, just adds this whole doctrine that says, but wait, such and such, such and such, and changes the whole Bible. This is basically what happened to the Jews. And so you can imagine back then when they got this Old Testament and they're reading it and they're into it, then they know that the Greeks are screwing them. They know that the Romans are screwing them. Then all of a sudden, this whole New Testament comes along that makes the Romans and Greeks be looked upon favorably. So now understand all of this history is building up to something. It's all building up to something. So stick with me, bear with me. I'm gonna get into all this Hebrew mess a little bit later on, but you gotta understand this Old Testament part. You gotta know this history in order for me to really crush this doctrine. I gotta crush this Old Testament first and show you the truth behind it because it has been changed so much. And it's one of the things that I'm gonna get into in this video about how much it was changed and why it was changed. Because there's a lot you have to explain about what happened in Israel. We know it obviously was full of black people, today it's not. How did that happen? 
We got to understand and realize the change that occurred. We got to look at these people differently and stop looking at the Bible as its actual history and look at actual history. The Bible is not. When you go look at the Bible, you're not looking at actual history. So I got to give you this history so you can know the truth. So bear with me. I know it's long. And, you know, if you stuck with me this long in this video, you are a true scholar or a true student and you under, you're trying to really understand real history. I get some people that complain about the length of videos and I look at them like if you can't watch, you know, a two hour, a two hour video or a three hour video, even a six hour video, I don't see you reading books. You know, I don't see people who can't sit there and watch a video and take notes actually reading the whole book. So I look at these people as, you know, comment thugs or jokes. You know, real scholars read, real scholars, what we would love, I would love to be able to just sit down and just watch a video and get a history. So understand this history, I'm giving you books. I'm giving you up so many books through the video. You can see that they pop up in the corner down there. It shows you what books to go reference. I'm giving you a lot of references because I really want you to get this history so I can break people out of this whole Bible crap. It is, it's a shame that so many people is caught up in this mess. And now for anybody who's really understanding what I'm saying in this video so far, when you look at it and you start learning the history, you see how stupid it really is that, you know, once you do some research, you can figure out what basically happened. So now we know that the whole Hellenization continued up until 300 AD. So we're talking 300 AD, this is under Roman rule. So again, why would the Romans continue Hellenization? You have Judaism and now you have Christianity, you know, begun, you know, going into full swing, basically. So why would you continue to push this Hellenization and this worship of Serapis? So now you got to understand that Hellenization was the spreading of Judaism and Christianity and not Serapis. They took Serapis and changed Serapis into Jesus Christ. You got Serapis, but they, they basically took Osiris and the Egyptian god Apis and put them together and gave us Serapis and put a white face on them to get these black people in Egypt to worship a white god, to get everybody to worship a white god. This is what they did. And they changed them into Jesus Christ. You got Jesus Christ. Jesus is basically attributes of Zeus and of the Druidic or the Druid carpenter god, Jesus. Now, the Greeks was the first to even write about the Druids, and we first heard about the Druids from the Greeks. So now this carpenter guy, Jesus is supposed to be the son of a carpenter. Yeah, that's where his name came from. It came from this carpenter guy, Jesus. So now you get Christos or Christ, which they used to call Serapis, Serapis Christos. But the first mention of a Christos is from what? It's from Homer's Iliad or Iliad and the Odyssey. He talks about Christos in the Odyssey on page uh, four and page 252 and in the Iliad on page 23 and 186. He talks about it being oil that you put on your body when you get out of the bathtub, which is the first mention of a Christ or Christos. So now the Greeks, they also write themselves into the New Testament as being looked upon favorably. They're talking to Christ and dealing with Christ. And Christ says, you know, no matter if you're Greek or Jew, it doesn't matter. As long as you believe in me, you know, you can be saved. So when you read 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 23 to 23, it says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. So the whole thing is, how are you going to get these Greeks wisdom through the Bible? And that's one of the things the Bible is about, because it teaches a lot about mathematics, especially astrology, but also physics. So when you go read Genesis 5.1, it's talking about the atom. Adam is basically the atom, not an actual man. Now, the thing is, when you read Genesis 5.1 through 2, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam and the day that God created man and the likeness of God made he him. Male and, free, and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam and the day they were created. Their name Adam. He called their name Adam. Meaning, how do you call Adam and Eve Adam? Now understand when you read Genesis 5, it doesn't even explain what happens to Eve. It doesn't even mention Eve at all. 
they're clearly trying to point to something here. They're talking about the atom. So now I've, I went through this in my previous video and I had a lot of people jump on in the comment section and say, oh, you're an idiot. And uh, they didn't know about atoms, you know, so long ago. And, you know, you stupid. I had people talk about that. And the whole thing is the first mention of atoms is by Leucippus, who was from Miletus. He's a Greek. He was from Ionia. He was an Ionian. This is the first mention of atoms. Aristotle is on record as going against them, saying that, you know, they couldn't fathom something so small being so powerful. So it's on record. They knew about atoms a long time ago, way before this Bible ever came about. They knew about atoms basically before the Greeks conquered uh, the Egyptians. They already knew about it. When you trace back and do the etymology on the word atom, it goes back to Greek, atomos. So they already knew about the atom a long time ago, which is why when you go and read Revelations, when it's talking about 666, it's talking about the atom. It's talking about man, six electrons, six protons, six neutrons creates carbon, which creates man. They knew about this already. I went into all this in that video. If you have not seen that video, that's game the Bible and Christianity finally explained, watch it. I know it's long, but check the video out. It has a lot of information. So now we can start bringing this whole thing to a close and start really destroying this whole Hebrew Israelite doctrine and shedding some light on it. Now understand this, from 92 BCE all the way until 629 AD, the Persians returned and were at war with the Romans. So we're talking about when the New Testament was being written and created, Rome was at war with the Persians. They was already at war with them for hundreds of years. This is a long war that lasted. Now, also, because of the New Testament, you had a bunch of Jews leaving Roman-controlled countries. They was leaving Israel. They was leaving Syria. They was going out into the Middle East and going out into Africa and teaching Judaism. The Christians was doing the same thing as well. We also know the Jews was going into Arabia and trying to spread uh, Judaism because the Persian king for roots was persecuting Jews in 460 AD. We know that the Jews was going into Yemen and persecuting the Christians and they eventually took over Yemen and he was persecuting Christians also in Ethiopia. Now in around 610 is when Islam really came onto the scene and started to spread. The Muslims eventually took over in Yemen and it was persecuting Jews all the way up until the 20th century. We know Steven Spielberg did a whole documentary on this and I showed a little bit of it in my video about Islam. So understand that the once the whole Arab conquest started, you had the Arabs going into all of these Christian and Judaism controlled places. All these Jews and Christians who was all spread throughout the Middle East and some into parts of Africa. Once Islam began to spread, the Arabs took over. So now understand, this is one of the parts I was talking about in my last video. You got to realize that the war between the Persians and the Romans ended in a status quo antebellum, which basically means a truce. So the whole thing is you got to look at it and say, well, how is it that the Arabs was able to use the Old Testament in their Islamic doctrine? And why would the Romans allow that? Why would the Jews allow it? So now understand that the Jews had hundreds of years to spread Judaism throughout the Arab world, throughout the Arab kingdom, throughout the Levant region, into the Middle East. As I said before, we know they went into Yemen. We know that the Jews were all over the Middle East, the Christians as well. They spread into Yemen, they spread into Syria, they spread into parts of Africa, into the Middle East, and they were both spreading this doctrine. Because one, you had basically a whole sect of Jews who was against Christianity way back then. They was persecuting the Christians way back then. A lot of the stories that you read about persecuted Christians was coming from the Jews coming from the Jews themselves. And a lot of people got confused and thought it was the Christians persecuting Christians when it was Jews persecuting them. People was blaming it on Rome saying, well, that came later on with the, um, with the, with the Crusades. I'm gonna get into that when the Christians was persecuting Christians. But before that, you had the Jews persecuting Christians. So understand there was a pre-Islamic Arab conquest. A lot of people, they go and look at the Arab conquest and they immediately associate it with Islam. But this was before Islam really came onto the scenes. We're talking about fifth century before uh, Muhammad was even supposed to be born. 
it was the Arab conquest and it was going and it was taking over a lot of areas that the Jews was ruling. We know they took over Yemen and they persecuted the Jews there. But when Islam came onto the scene and a lot of those Arabs started to adopt Islam, it became a whole Islamic conquest and they conquered a lot of areas. They came into Israel, they came into Egypt, they came into a, the whole Levant region and they took over so many territories controlled by the Jews and the Christians. So understand, this is where the change occurred. This is how Egypt became full of Arabs. This is how the so-called black Hebrews got from out of Israel and it became full of Arabs, full of Greeks because of the Islamic slave trade, which occurred, which began in 650 AD. So understand when you read Deuteronomy 28, 68, and it's talking about going back to Egypt and ships, and they want you to think, these Hebrews want you to think that it's talking about America. How come it's not talking about the Muslims? The first slavery that these people that was inside of Israel occurred happened under Islam didn't happen in America. So why is it Deuteronomy 28, 68, talking about the Arabs, talking about the Muslims, saying that they will go into slavery under Islam? Why isn't it saying anything about that? Because the first slavery that these people endured happened under Allah, happened in Islam. And we all know this. So that's one of the things that I always point out to these uh, so-called Hebrew Israelites and saying, well, where's the prophecy about the Muslims? Why, why is it talking about slavery that's going to occur thousands of years later when the first major slavery that they run into is under the Arabs? And it was enslaved under the Arabs for longer, twice the time that they would be enslaved under the people in America, under the Americans, under the white people there. So it's suspect as hell, like I said, but I'm going to get into Deuteronomy 28, 68, because like I said, they didn't always say that. They changed that. And I'm going to show you. So now, once you take out the descendants of the ancient Egyptians from Israel, who do you have left? We know that the Greeks was there. We know that some Arabs was there. So now realize that when the Jews were spreading, when they were spreading the whole Jewish doctrine throughout the Middle East, we know that Arabs was coming into Israel. They was coming into Israel. So once the black people was enslaved, that's who you had left. You had Arabs, you had Greeks. So you had Jews and Greeks that was inside of Israel. So when you look at the people of Israel today, look at them, take a look. Who do they look like? You can't barely tell who's Greek and who is a Jew. So look at these people. Look at this, look at these people here. Which are they? Are these Jews or are these Greeks? These are Greek people with the Australian Prime Minister. Look at these people here, you can't tell. Are these people Jews or are they Greeks? These people are Greeks. Look at these people. Who are they? Jews or Greeks? They're Jews. It's hard for you to even tell. We can see what clearly happened in Israel. We can see the change that occurred. So you have there today a mix of basically Arab Jews and Greek Jews and Greek people. That's who are in, that's, those are the people who are in Israel today. Look at the flag of Israel, look at it. Now look at the Greek flag, they're the same colors, the blue and white, same color flag. These are the same people, they just mixed together and they've been in Israel ever since. So now when we look at history, we can see what really happened. We can see how the Arabs took over Egypt and how they are in Egypt still to this day. We can see why the people in Israel, we can see why they look the way they look. Some of them look like white people, some of them look like Arabs. Some of them look like a mix between white people and Arabs. A lot of people couldn't really tell, which is why we get these Jews who look like this today because we know the Greeks was there. These people are of Greek descent, they're Greeks. That's who they are. They are not the true Hebrews. So when the Hebrews say that, well, the original Hebrews was black, well, yeah, of course they was because their whole region was black at some point. But understand that when you say they black, now you know the history of how they became Hebrews. So when you're talking about the Jews coming in and spreading Judaism, these a lot of these people was black in the beginning. In the beginning, there was black people. There was Africans. There was the, the descendants of the ancient Egyptians spreading 
uh, Judaism. So when it was coming into Africa, which is why people say, well, you got the Igbo or the Ibu tribes in Africa who are Hebrews. Well, yeah, because you had black people coming and spreading that whole doctrine inside Africa. But this was way after the conquest, way after indoctrination. We ain't talking about BCE. We talking about AD. So you can't say that these people are ancient. You know, they're from the original tribes or from the original uh, Hebrews because there's no such thing. These people didn't even start out becoming a people until the Greeks took over Egypt and made up the whole doctrine. And this is what history is showing us. So this is why these Hebrews tell you that, oh no, the uh, black Hebrews in Israel, they left Israel and went into Africa. They don't want to mention this whole conquest of the Arabs. They, wanna, they don't want to bring up the whole uh, Arab conquest. They want to make it like they escaped the Arabs and escaped the uh, Arab slave trade and somehow made it into West Africa. When that's bullcrap, they want to avoid it because it don't make no sense because the Bible don't mention it. The Bible don't talk about it, so they try to avoid it all together and say that, well, they left Israel, they went into Africa, got into West Africa, and they somehow, they want you to believe they somehow never intermarried or never mingled with the uh, people, the Africans in West Africa, and that somehow, once the slave trade came along, the transatlantic slave trade, that these Africans in West Africa were somehow able to point out these black Hebrews and say, well, he's a Hebrew, she's a Hebrew, they Hebrews, take them, we'll sell them to you. It don't make no sense for these people to be in Africa for hundreds of years and never intermarry or interbreed with the people in Africa. That's bullcrap. Now understand, we don't have pictures, actual pictures of the original slaves. We don't have pictures of these original slaves before they came to America. But you will have to believe, if you're going to believe these Hebrew Israelites, you will have to believe, one, that Every single black Hebrew that was in Israel was able to escape the sub-Saharan slave trade, the whole Islamic slave trade for over 800 years. You would have to believe that. You would have to believe that they all was able to dodge slavery for 800 years by the Arabs and made it into uh, Africa safely until somehow the people in Africa was able to point them out. I mean, look at the slaves from back then. Look at them. I mean, look at those slaves from back then and then look at the people in Africa. It's very hard for you to tell that these people are not Africans. So tell me how the hell these other Africans going to point to these people right here and say, you a Hebrew, you a Hebrew, you a Hebrew, take them. It's bullshit. They insulting your intelligence for you if they want you to believe this. They insulting you. To me, it's an insult. It's an insult for you to believe this stuff. For you to say this stuff to me, it's telling me that you think I'm stupid. Seriously. This is crazy. This is madness. When you look at history, history doesn't support this at all, which is why they run to that Bible. So now let's get into the whole Crusades because the Crusades is a big part of this. And this whole thing is coming to an end because it's not much it's going to take to crush the rest of this Hebrew doctrine once you understand history. So now understand the whole Crusades was basically about a couple things. It was about, one, taking back the territories and the lands that was controlled by the Arab conquest and territories that was taken over by Muslim conquest. The other thing was to get rid of and silence all of the naysayers of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, another thing is this. The term or the name Catholic was not made up by the Romans. The term and the name of Catholic already existed under the Greeks. It means whole or universal. Now, the thing was... The Roman Catholic Church used the name Catholic to basically separate themselves from other churches because a lot of churches started to come up against the Roman Catholic Church because, you know, they had a pope and they was trying to make themselves to be the leader of the whole thing. And a lot of people wasn't with it. So the Crusades was really about them going in there and wiping out a lot of these Christian churches. And as I said before, this is when they're talking about the uh, Catholics killing Christians because that's what it was about, the Crusades. They didn't want to recognize the Pope as being the authority over Christianity, so it was wiping out a lot of these churches and peoples. That, that's what the Crusades was about. Now, understand Catholic is one of the um, basically four terms or four marks used by the church that was specified in the Council of Nicaea, the whole Nicene Creed. They specified four marks that basically make you like a true Christian or a true Catholic. And being Catholic or whole or universal was one of those terms. But the main thing was for them to go back and take over those lands. So now, 
this is where the whole thing with the uh, English comes into place. Because during the Crusades, they conquered into a lot of Europe. And they start taking over a lot of these territories. So understand, even though England had a king and everything, a lot of these kings and these monarchies answered to the Pope. They answered to Rome for a long time. So understand, when the Crusades happened, a lot of people separated themselves from Roman Catholicism. A lot of people did not like Rome. They didn't like what they was doing because, of course, the word was spreading around that the Crusaders was coming and destroying a whole bunch of churches because these people would not agree with Rome. So the Great Schism happened in the 11th century during the Crusades. Now, the Great Schism was basically where you get the separation of Christianity and Catholicism because they basically couldn't agree. They couldn't agree on the source of the Holy Spirit, and they definitely couldn't agree on the Pope having universal jurisdiction over the whole religion. They couldn't agree on it. So this is where the separation occurred. So now this is going to bring me into the whole King James part of it. I don't have nothing to say about him being, you know, bisexual, homosexual, anything like that like that because he had two kids so he probably was bisexual but that's besides the point the whole thing is this it really begins with the whole protestant reformation that's when this whole thing really starts and why what led to the creation of the king james version now the protestant reformation began in 1517 somewhere in germany now the protestants basically wanted to get rid of any remnants of roman catholicism inside of certain churches so now understand that Rome ruled Great Britain from 43 AD to 410 AD. But after the whole thing was over, they still had control over the uh, Church of Great Britain for a while. Now, when King Henry VIII came along and assumed the throne, he couldn't get a male heir from his wife. So he wanted a divorce. He wanted Pope Clement to get him a divorce from his wife because she couldn't provide him with a son. They had a daughter. So now when Pope Clement didn't grant him his divorce, he passed two laws. The first one was in 1532 with the submission of the clergy. Now the submission of the clergy basically said that they could not change any laws or make any rules without permission from the king. Then in 1534, the Acts of Supremacy was passed, which basically said that they would take all the taxes that they were sending to Rome and make those taxes from the church payable to the crown. And also, nobody could basically ask Rome for anything, whether it had to do with religion or otherwise. It was forbidden. So you couldn't even talk to Rome and say anything to Rome. Nobody from the Church of Great Britain could talk to Rome under these new laws. So once these things was passed, the Protestant Reformation got in there and was saying, you know what, we need to get rid of any remnants of Rome. So in 1539, King Henry VIII gave us the Great Bible. And it was prepared by some Protestant scholars from England. Now, some of these same Protestant scholars from England later went to Geneva, Switzerland, and they created the Geneva Bible in 1560. Now, remember, the Geneva Bible was the one that had the annotations. They had the, the writings that was on the side, basically the commentary that was talking about the Bible. And the Geneva Bible is also the Bible that named the Pope as the Antichrist. So now a lot of the ruling elite in uh, England who was under uh, Queen Elizabeth I, they didn't like the annotations in the Geneva Bible. A lot of people didn't like the Geneva Bible because they said it was, it was being too honest. It was giving away too much. So in 1568, Queen Elizabeth I gave us the Bishop's Bible. It was revised in 1572. So then... In 15, uh, excuse me, in 1604 is when King James convened the Hampton Court Conference because the Puritans had a problem with Queen Elizabeth's Bible. A lot of people was concerned with the um, translation from the Hebrew. A lot of people didn't believe it was a good translation. They didn't believe that the uh, Great Bible by King Henry VIII was a good translation of the Hebrew. So understand what's taking place here. You basically had, once the Crusades started, you had Rome going out and wiping out the churches who was not accepting the Pope as having universal jurisdiction over the Bible, over Catholicism, over Christianity. Wiping these people out who didn't accept certain uh, terminologies that or certain rituals that the Catholic Church was using and things they was doing. You know, where the Holy Spirit comes from, the whole divinity of Jesus. So many different things they disagreed upon, which caused the Great Schism and that big divide. So now when you go to King James, you look at how the King James Version came into place. It had nothing to do with somebody laying hands on King James and, you know, King James being filled with the spirit and, or being an Israelite or anything like that. 
It had everything to do with them trying to separate from Rome. This is what the Protestants was doing. This is what the Puritans was doing. It was going out and trying to eradicate any traces of Roman Catholicism from churches. Because you can't sit up there and say, I'm a man of God and God this and that and Jesus this. And you're going out and you're killing Christians. You can't do that. So a lot of people didn't accept Rome. So understand, the whole thing with the King James Version was to separate themselves from Rome. So in doing that, they obviously changed the doctrine. So we know that in Catholicism, they have to do the canonical books. They have Maccabees. They have all those seven books that the King James Version do not have. They left them out saying that they were never written in Hebrew and it was only written in Greek. So they shouldn't be a part of the Bible, which is why the Deuterocanonical books are not in the King James Version but are in the Catholic books and in the old books. So now their whole thing was, these things was never written in Hebrew. They wasn't written in Aramaic. And of course, back then they could not know. So what the Hebrews would tell you is God put a spirit on King James and on the translators to get a perfect translation of the Bible. And that they used the Masoretic text or they used Texas Rescriptors or they used some kind of Hebrew uh, codex or manuscript so they would get the translation correct. They didn't use what the Romans was using. And the thing is, they always say that, you know, the King James Version is just like the Dead Sea Scrolls. But guess what? The King James Version does not contain the Deuteronomy Canonicals. It doesn't have it in there. It doesn't have Maccabees. But the Dead Sea Scrolls does. The Dead Sea Scrolls has the Deuteronomy Canonicals. It has Maccabees. It does not have a Book of Esther. So how could the King James Version be like the Dead Sea Scrolls when the Dead Sea Scrolls have those books and the King James Version does not? You would think not having those seven books in there, including the prophecies of Daniel, the extra prophecies, those extra books that was in Daniel and some other books, you would think that would dramatically change the Bible. And it obviously has. So the whole thing is what was going on was the people when they was writing these Bible Bibles, look at all the people who wrote Bibles after the Crusades. You remember Rome was basically taking over Christianity everywhere. They were saying, you know, you can't translate it from Latin. You can't do this. You can't write it in English. Remember John Wycliffe, John Huss. Remember all the people who was killed for translating Bibles, burnt at the stake for what they were doing. This was Rome doing this. They didn't want nobody to change anything, but you had England, you had other places who was changing these Bibles. They was taking out things that they didn't agree with Rome on, and it was changing the books. So it's not like what Rome had. But this is the thing that people are not remembering. Where did all this stuff come from? It came from Rome. So if you change anything that they did, you are changing what is close to the original. So think about it. Where did this thing start? It started with the Greeks and the Romans. Remember, we don't have a Hebrew version of the Septuagint. When the Septuagint was first written, it was in Greek. They say we, it came from a Hebrew version, but we never had that version. Just all of a sudden, we got this Greek version of the Septuagint, and we got an explanation called the Letters of Orestius. We never had no Hebrew version. Now, for over 300 years, the Jews agreed with this Greek version because they spoke Greek. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that somebody decided to translate it into Hebrew when the New Testament came out. And they didn't want to deal with that New Testament in Greek. They wanted, it in, they wanted a Hebrew uh, Old Testament. So you had the Masoretes begin to start writing the uh, Septuagint in Hebrew. This is when it started. This is when this whole thing started, but we don't have that Septuagint. We don't have none of that. So as far as we know, the only books we have are in Greek or Latin with the codices and the Latin Vulgate. So any book that happened after that, we talk about, you can't have a King James Version. John, John uh, Rycliffe and John Huss and uh, King Henry VIII, Queen Elizabeth, all these people could not write Bibles if it was not for these codices and the books that preceded them that came from Rome. So, of course, when you talk about uh, the Bible, the King James Version using the Masoretic text. Well, where did the Masoretic text get its writings from? They had to use something. They didn't just come up out of nowhere and just write a Bible. They had to get the idea from something or copy it from something. So they obviously got it from the codices. They got it from the Latin Vulgate. So they basically took the Septuagint Greek and basically read it and translated it into Hebrew. 
So it's basically saying what the Septuagint said, and they changed and took out whatever they disagreed with. This is what happened. So none of it is close to the original, but it don't matter anyway because it's all bullshit. So we can kill all that nonsense about a black man creating the Bible. We can kill all that because we know when you start doing the research, the research does not support it. This is why King James has to be a black man. This is why they have to tell you this, because they know when you go back and start doing the history, you can't deny Rome's involvement with the Bible. You can't deny the Greeks' involvement with the Old Testament. You can't deny it. It's there, period. All of a sudden, we have this Greek Septuagint out of nowhere. We have this Greek Septuagint. Now, we know, of course, the ancient Greeks were black, but we ain't talking about those Greeks. We know Alexander the Greek was white, period. We know this happened under uh, the rule of the Ptolemies, because this is where the whole letters of Orestius fraud happens at. So it goes back to these white Greeks, period. And we know the Romans was white. So we can kill the whole noise about the Bible being created by black men. So let's kill that. Now, let's get into this Deuteronomy 2868, because as I said, it is not the same. When you go back to the original, to the oldest versions of the Bible, it don't say nothing about no Egypt or no ships. So understand, we do not have an ancient copy of Deuteronomy. I'm talking about before uh, 500 AD, written in Hebrew. It don't exist. We don't have a complete copy. The oldest complete copy of Deuteronomy that we have is in Codex Sinaiticus. Now, remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls, take a look at them. This is Deuteronomy and the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's pieces. This is what they give you. Because they know it don't say anything like the King James Version. And it doesn't even say the same thing that the Codices say. It says something completely different, and I'm sure of that. So we don't have an ancient copy of Deuteronomy. We don't have a BC copy of Deuteronomy that's complete. The oldest complete copy of Deuteronomy that we have is in Codex Sinaiticus. And it doesn't say anything about no ships. It doesn't say anything about no going back to Egypt on ships or slaves or anything to that effect at all. So we're going to take a look at it and see what it actually says. So now we have the website for Codex Sinaiticus and I want you to see right off the bat this is all that we have. Chapter 3, 4, 28, 29, and 30. That's it. Now this is the most complete copy of Deuteronomy that we have that dates before 500 AD. Nothing else on earth is more complete than this, period. We know that Dead Sea Scrolls is older but it's not as complete. Codex Sinaiticus has the most complete version of the Bible. The most complete, it's the most complete Bible on earth, period. So when you go back and you're trying to figure out what the what is as closest to the original as possible, you have to go to Codex Sinaiticus. You can't go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's in pieces. Now this manuscript was actually stashed away at some point in time in um, Mount Sinai at a monastery. And it was found by Constantine von Tichendorf in the 1800s. So it was sitting there for hundreds of years and it's in pretty good condition. Now here you see a little bit of uh, holes or whatever like that, but you can actually make these words out. You can actually make them out and see what it's saying, but they give it to you over here. So here is 68, Deuteronomy 28, 68. We can see it here. And when we match it up with King James Version, I mean, you can eyeball it and see that it's completely different. Doesn't even start off with Kai and doesn't even say the same thing. So here it is. This is what it's saying in Sinaiticus. Completely different. Nothing about Egypt, nothing about ship or slavery or anything like that. So understand that we know, as I showed you in my last video, the scribes made mistakes. So if you try to copy and paste and do like a Google Translate, if a word, if a letter is off, you're not going to get the correct translation. You got to know or show it to somebody who actually knows who can read Greek. And I mean, one of the things that you do is when you start reading manuscripts is you can kind of tell a difference that if a scribe was trying to say like uh, that and, sp and spelled it than, and you can just like read it and say that, well, maybe he meant that. I know he didn't mean than. And it's just little, you know, errors like that. So if somebody's trying to say the and they spell it T-H-O or T-H-A, I know they probably meant T-H-E. So when you read these manuscripts, it's saying here, definite place there presents an enemy unto your child and child run away and not be the inquiry. 
And that's basically what it's saying. Something about children. Doesn't say anything about no ships. Doesn't say anything about Egypt. Definite place that presents an enemy unto your child and child run away and not be the inquire eat. That's what it's saying. So when people read this thing, when they read the King James Version and they look at it, they are thinking that it says the exact same thing here in Codex Sinaiticus or in the Septuagint or in the original Bible. And it doesn't. It's not the same. They changed it, obviously. So when you read in all those passages, <clears throat> excuse me, from the King James Version, it's talking about slavery. The King James Version, they started in 1604, finished in 1611. Slavery was going on for hundreds of years already. Of course they knew about the iron around the neck. Of course they knew about what was happening to the slaves. They knew about the stuff already, and they wrote it in the Bible. This is what happened. So here's the proof right here. You can go through the manuscript yourself. Don't take my word for it. Go through it yourself and do the comparison. It's not the same. Now, you can't go to the Dead Sea Scrolls and do a comparison because it's not complete. Because they don't want you to know what it says. But here's the proof right here. It doesn't say the same thing. So when we look at Codex Sinaiticus, we can see it's clearly different from the King James Version. Now, I should note as well, in Codex Sinaiticus, they only have Deuteronomy 28, 68, and 69. It doesn't even have the rest of Deuteronomy 28. So we can't even go in there and look at uh, the rest of Deuteronomy 28 and see if, what it says. If, see if it's talking about, you know, what would happen if the Hebrews obey God and disobey God. We can't even figure that out because it doesn't even say that. We don't have it. We don't have it in there. But if Deuteronomy 28, 68 is different from the King James Version, then obviously the rest of Deuteronomy is different as well. So we can at least draw that conclusion because the story wouldn't add up. You got to understand that giving you all these different versions, don't you think that when you change the Bible in any way, it's going to take away from what it originally said? So how in the world is the King James Version going to leave out the Deuterocanonicals? How is they going to leave out and change so many different things that's in the, uh, the oldest manuscripts? This obviously changes the actual Bible and changes the message. This is one of the things that, you know, scholars try to point out, but a lot of religious people don't want to accept that. Yes, you separated yourself from the Romans, but without the Romans, you get no Christianity because they are the ones who put this thing on the forefront. The Jews didn't do it. The Jews didn't even agree with Christianity. They didn't want nothing to do with it. They want their separate way. But without the Romans, you don't get what we have today. You'll have Judaism. That's it. It would have been no need for King James or anybody else to make a Bible, a New Testament or anything like that, because we would just have Judaism if it wasn't for Rome. So when they sit there and tell you that a black man created this Bible, bull, they know for a fact you can't get around the Roman involvement in the Bible and the Greek involvement in the Bible, which is why, as I say, King James has to be black and he had to have had a spirit put on him to give him the truth, which is why it's all different. Yeah, that sounds all well and good, but that's not what the proof is telling us. So let's get into this whole tribe of Shem thing because I'm tired of it. So now one of the first things that the Hebrew Israelites will say to you is that we do not come from Africa. We come from the tribe of Shem. We come from Israel. Our ancestors who were brought to America came from Israel or came from Africa, but originally from Israel and are of the tribe of Shem. But I have shown you, we have no history of a tribe of Shem in real life. So they are saying that the Israelites come from this tribe. The Hebrews come from these people. We don't have no history of this at all. We don't have any history. But this is what they want you to believe. So now we went over before. And I've shown you that when you read 2 Samuel, it's talking about King David going into Jebus or Jerusalem and basically conquering the Jebusites. You know, he's there. He's talking about if he smite the deaf and the lame, I'll make somebody a chief or a captain or something like that. When you read 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5. Now, the whole thing is this is Jerusalem, but it's telling you that Jerusalem was called something different before it was called Jerusalem. It was called Jebus. Now, we know that it was inhabited by the Jebusites, who are descendants of Ham. So we're talking about black people. We're talking about these Israelites and King David coming into Jerusalem or into Jebus and killing these black people and taking over their land, right? So according to the Hebrew Israelites, 
King David and these Israelites supposed to be us, supposed to be black people. So you got black on black crime, right? So you got the Israelites supposed to be of the line of Shem coming into Jerusalem, right? But Ezekiel 16, and I know a Hebrew who is smart is going to, you know, cringe right now and say, oh, shit, here you go with that Ezekiel 16 shit. Yeah, here I go. It says, thus say the Lord unto Jerusalem. He didn't say unto Jebus. He didn't say unto the Jebusites. He says, thus says the Lord unto Jerusalem, thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother a Hittite. You read Genesis 10 and 15, it tells you the descendants of Ham and the Amorites and the Hittites are the descendants of Ham, black people. So God is saying, Jerusalem, you come from Ham, but Jerusalem is supposed to be of Shem. It's supposed to be where the Israelites come from. So God is saying here that the Israelites come from Ham. He's basically telling you what I've been saying in this whole video, that these people were black. But let's go down here. Let's make sure we're talking about the same Israelites, the same people. So when you go read 16, 8, it says, Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and enter into a covenant with thee, save the Lord God, and thou becometh mine. So did God make a covenant with the Jebusites? No. Did he make a covenant with Jebus? No. He made a covenant with the Israelites, the people of Jerusalem. So why is it saying in the beginning? Why is he saying that these people come from the line of Ham, but these Hebrew Israelites are telling you we came from Shem? What's going on here? So now let's bring this whole thing together so you can understand what is taking place and what this book is about. This Bible, especially the Old Testament, is all about the conquest of black people, period. They never mention any of the people of the tribe of Shem. They don't go into what happened to these people. We don't find them in history. We don't find them nowhere. The Bible tells you that they don't build anything. They don't build any cities. They go into lands that was built by the people of the tribe of Ham and conquer it. Just like in real life. What happened in real life? All the lands that we had, they came into and took. You're talking about the people from Japheth and from Shem. But who are they really? Who are they really? We're talking about Arabs. And we're talking about the Romans and the Greeks. We're talking about white people. We're talking about Arabs. That's who Japheth and Shem represents. Period. Don't represent no black people. Black people are of Ham. If you want to go and use it biblically. But in real life, it's just justifying what they did to us that Saul is doing by saying that we conquered these black people and took their land, murdered them, stole their history because God said it was okay. So when we go to Deuteronomy 7 and we start reading, it's backing up exactly what I'm saying, trying to make it biblical, saying that God said it was okay. So it says, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goeth to possess it, and have cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. This is real history right here. That's what it's talking about. That's what it's basing it off. They went in and conquered all these lands. This is a black people it's talking about. These are the lands of black folks that we had the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians and the Arabs come in and take from us. They took it from us under the guise of religion, under the guise of this made up God, basically saying that it was ordained by God. This is God's will that these people be wiped out and destroyed and we take over their lands because they never show you in the Bible the people of Shem building anything. They don't build anything, they don't have any cities. They come into cities and they conquer, plain and simple. It's trying to take history and make it biblical and use it to justify what happened to black people. That's all it is, that they were set apart. These are God's special people, so God allowed this to happen. So when you go to Deuteronomy 7, you continue reading, it says, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them from thee, 
Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Let's go down here to, um, to 6. It says, For thou art an holy people unto uh, the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So these people are special. But he's talking about the people who are from the tribe of Ham. He ain't talk about no Shemitic people. He's talking about people that come from Ham, not nobody that come from Shem and Japheth. When you do the etymology or when you, when you chase back the genealogy, excuse me, from Genesis 10, 15, these people come from Ham. So when you read in it, and it's talking about utterly destroying these people, and these people are supposed to be Israelites who destroy these people. I mean, we talk about they destroy their own people when you read in Deuteronomy. When it's talking about destroying the Jebusites and the Hittites and the uh, Hivites and all these black people, we're talking about black people killing black people. This is what it's saying, because one minute God is saying in, in the Bible that, hey, you people from Jerusalem, you come from these people. He just said that you come from, how are you destroying yourself? Didn't he just say your, your birth and your nativity is of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites? But then it says in Deuteronomy 7 that, hey, y'all go and utterly destroy these people. It's the same people. Y'all destroyed yourself. What's going on here? So it's clearly trying to tell you something here. Which is why I tell you this is a parable. So now when you read in Deuteronomy and it's talking about utterly destroying these people, wiping them out, show me in history where the Israelites conquered the Hittites. Show me in history where the Israelites conquered any of these people. If the Israelites was going around and conquering all these people, they would have been written about. There would have been monuments. There would have been so many people talking about these bad ass Israelites going around conquering everything. But there's no mention. Herodotus says nothing. Diodorus says nothing. Nobody says anything about these Israelites conquering the way the Bible is describing them because it never happened. The people who was doing all the conquering was the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians and later the Arabs and Muslims. So now the Hebrew Israelites want you to accept that we are where we are at today because we broke God's law. We broke the covenant with God. Slavery happened. We are being oppressed to this day all because we are being punished for breaking God's covenant, for breaking his law and disobeying God. But all the other races get to get a pass. They get a pass. Look at the Asians. Look at the white people. All the stuff that they have been doing for centuries. Nothing happened to them. They get to be rich and grow their economy, grow their people, and become successful. But black people, we got to endure this hell because we had supposedly broken this covenant. And got nothing to do with me today or you today. We ain't got nothing to do with, with our ancestors, what our ancestors did. But they want you to believe that it's going to be all right and that the Messiah is going to come back and he's going to take care of these white folks because they got to pay for what they did. So why do the white people living today have to pay for something that their ancestors did? They ain't had nothing to do with it. Just like we ain't had nothing to do with it. Does this sound like something that is correct to you? It doesn't even really make sense. The doctrine don't even sound good to me. So when these Hebrew Israelites, when they point to the pyramid on the back of the dollar and they say that, see, it represents Egypt. America is the new place of slavery. But they don't tell you that right around that crest, it says Mason. If you're going to accept that pyramid, you got to accept that it spells out Mason around it and that crest because King James was a Mason. And that's what this thing really is about. That's why they're using the pyramid, because that's where they stole the knowledge from our people and created their empire that they have today. Our empire is crowned a success. That's what it's talking about on that dollar. Their empire has come to fruition. They have succeeded. King James was a Mason, period. Francis Bacon, the man who actually revised it or went over the Bible after it was written, he went and coded the whole thing, which is why it's saying what it's saying. So if you want to point to that dollar and that crust with the pyramid, you got to point to Mason. You also will have to point out 
the Freemasonry that surrounds Jesus Christ. You have to point out the fact that he died at 33, Masonic number. You have to point out that he traveled with 12 disciples. He would make 13, Masonic number. It's 13 steps going up that pyramid. It also corresponds with the Zodiac. Jesus would be the sun. The 12 disciples would be the 12 signs of the Zodiac. Now, I went into this more, this whole Francis Bacon and uh, King James thing in my video, who really established America and what the Bible has to do with it. Check that video out. And also check out That's Game, the Bible and Christianity Finally Explained. It will tie everything together. This video and those two videos will just bring everything home for you. And you will just have a complete knowledge of this whole thing. And you will see clearly that this Hebrew Israelite doctrine is bullcrap. You will really understand that. Like I said, no way in the world they would let these people stand on the corner and scream at white people downtown if they didn't want this doctrine out. I mean, look at the times right now. Look at the times. We got white cops killing black people. We got this whole racial tension, excuse me, going on in America. So this doctrine fits perfectly for people to start accepting this doctrine and saying, white people are this, white people are that, and you know, your house shots going to come back and destroy them all. How you sitting there waiting, not doing nothing with your arms folded. You're going to die with your arms folded, looking at your watch. So pay attention to the times. Look at the times right now. You got white cops killing all these black people, shooting them dead in the street, innocent black people. Since when did the cops allow black people to stand on the corner? Since when did they allow that? Since when did they allow us to, to stand on the corner peacefully? We stand on the corner peacefully. You can't go in your own neighborhood today. You and eight of your friends and chill on the corner without the cops harassing you. But these Hebrew Israelites get to go downtown. They get to go into Times Square. They get to go into areas where white people frequent and spew hate and call them devils and tell them that they're going to hell and all kinds of stuff, screaming at white people. They get to stand up on a podium with a microphone and speakers, a bullhorn and scream at white folks, since when would they allow that to happen? This is part of an agenda, people. Wake up, seriously. You don't think those rich white people who live downtown went and said something about this? You don't think they made their voice heard and said something? This is part of an agenda. It's just that simple. You can go ahead and cite freedom of speech and this and that. Well, why is it any different in our neighborhoods when we sitting there just talking, conversating, ain't screaming at nobody? So now I just want to thank everybody who actually watched this video in its entirety. You know, I get so many questions from people who claim they watched the video already. And it's like, you know, if you actually watch the entire video, you wouldn't be asking me this question. So I know videos, you know, get long and I go, I get long winded. I'm not the most articulate person in the world. You know, I don't speak particularly well or better than anybody else. But, you know, this is just my research and I'm trying to get it out to people. I may be a little boring, maybe a little long winded and might not be very entertaining. But if you are a scholar, if you're trying to get information, I'm going to give you what I have and what I know. And I want to thank people who have, you know, stuck with me and follow, you know, this whole journey. Because really, I mean, when I started doing this thing, it was just to really give back to my study group, to people who I was really into this information with. Since I left the country, I wanted to still share information. I had no clue so many people would actually watch my videos. So I want to thank people who have you know stuck by me and defended me in the comment section. The comment section is war. You know, you see me, I, I don't mind commenting with people and debating with people in the comment section because you know I'm not trying to be some kind of you know, internet celebrity or anything like that, or famous from doing these videos. I don't ask for donations or anything like that. I mean, I have a donation thing on my page, yes, but I don't really promote it. I just promoted it just now, but you know, I don't really, really promote it. But I'm just here trying to share information and just uh, get people to wake up, you know, get people to wake up and see what's going on. This religion is separation. That's what it was designed for. These people at this top block where they use the pyramid, we're talking about the same people in the Bible that took over. We're talking about, well, I'm not going to say in the Bible. Let's say in real life. We're talking about the Romans and Greeks, the Jews, the Muslims. They took over this whole thing. And they are together at this top block, seriously. Because this is why you see videos of the Pope with the uh, Islamic leader or with the Jewish leader. Because they end this thing together. They end this whole thing. It's one big scam. Seriously. 
They don't care if some Muslims here blow up some Christians there, long as they don't get hurt. So big shout out to Ally Coalition Jump Off Commander. Big shout out to everybody who's been sharing the videos. I really owe the amount of views and the amount of subscribers to you guys because I haven't really been able to promote as much as I would like to because I basically, you know, been busy. I run my own company here and I'm trying to get it to become, you know, self-sustaining because I'm going to be headed back to America sometime this year to finish my PhD. So I wanted to get everything done here and out of the way so I can go back and knock it out and, and you know, and, and come back here and, and finish doing what I've been doing. So you might end up seeing me in Philly or on the West Coast, but definitely want to give a shout out to you guys. And I want to thank everybody for the support. And yes, I do have a book coming out sometime next year. It'll probably be in the spring. I've actually written about six books. This will be the first one to actually get published. Publishers ain't cheap, so... You know, I've been working hard trying to get get it done right. If I put out a book, I want the book to be right. I don't want it to be not corny. I don't want it to be thin. I don't want it to be boring. So you now I've really been putting a lot of work into putting my first book out and getting it out there. So it'll be out sometime next year for sure. But thanks, everybody. Like, comment, share, and see you next video.